Judge Newman presiding. Morning. First, I want to address the um, <clears throat> ruling yesterday, uh, overruling the objection by the defense uh, to the state's question of the uh, witness on redirect as to whether he was aware of certain things that had occurred earlier uh, on June 7th involving uh, Mr. Murdoch or Murdoch Duck. In the uh, questioning, cross-examination of the witness by Mr. Griffin, the witness was asked whether he could think of any um, reason the gist of it, if you can think of any reason possible why um, Mr. Uh, Murdoch would commit the crimes he's accused of committing. <clears throat> that, in effect, uh, turned the cross-examination of that witness from uh, dealing with the specific issues in the case to uh, having that witness testify as a character witness for uh, Mr. Murdoch, uh, among his other uh, areas of inquiry, was his being a loving father, great provider, uh, financially secure, um, things of that nature, uh, all indicating an opinion by that witness as to uh, the good character of the defendant uh, either through direct statements or circumstantially through the evidence that was adduced from that witness. Uh, in the court's view, that opened the door for the state to respond uh, by asking questions, as the state did. Um, <clears throat> hence, the court overruled the objections. In addition to all of that, the objection was uh, totally inappropriate. Uh, as the court laid out and reviewed with the parties early in the trial, that objection should be made and the legal basis stated. An objection of totally inappropriate uh, is, in the words of um, Judge Joe Anderson, in effect, no objection at all. That's not a legal basis for an objection. Um, that summarizes the, the basis for the court's ruling on that issue uh, as to those questions yesterday. And that character type evidence was not only um, sought by, um, from Mr. Gibson, but also, was it Loving? Uh, but also Mr. Loving. <clears throat> and none of that really implicated uh, Rule 404, uh, 404B. Um, you know, one, it opened the door. Number two, it's 404A type um, reputation, uh, questioning that the state had a right to respond to uh, per the rules. Um, and, and, and thirdly, it addressed an issue raised in the case by the defense. Uh, the defense in the case has primarily been uh, the defendant has such a great character uh, that uh, he could not possibly have committed these offenses. Uh, that's been a general thread from opening statement throughout. Uh, in addition, the, um, the defense introduced uh, 
through that witness, which was also introduced through uh, other testimony in the case by uh, the defendant, that the boating case uh, was a reason for um, the, the murders to have occurred. And um, by the defense inquiring of the witness yesterday, as to his knowledge and belief concerning, or his knowledge concerning the Bowdoin case, that likewise opened the door for the state to address that issue. Um, and that's the basis for the court's ruling as to opening the door, uh, introducing the Bowdoin case, and reputation type evidence that the state had a right to respond. Under Rule 403, <clears throat> Uh, yet to be addressed by the court is Rule 404 issues. Um, and those issues uh, will, to some degree, have to be addressed in camera. Uh, and I'm wondering if the state has other witnesses to testify as to other things since we have the jury here ready to go prior to addressing other those any other well we do have a first of all we do have a um, snapchat custodian who has flown in that we need to get in so that person can make the flight uh, based on uh, how things ended yesterday uh, I do I was prepared this morning we we're planning on going forward uh, with some of the witnesses from the law firm and that's going to uh, there's certainly stuff beyond 404 but that's also going to put some of the 404 issues uh, squarely uh, squarely into play uh, so that's uh, that's kind of where we were planning to go um, this morning, Your Honor, uh, with, with the testimony that we have. Uh, I can certainly get some more forensic people uh, rolling. Um, and I'm, I apologize if I sort of misread uh, um, what we needed to be ready to do, but that's that's kind of what we focused on uh, last night and are ready to address this morning. Yeah, well, the, the court didn't have a lot of time to do jury planning issues, and it might have, you know, the jurors typically come at 9.30, it might have been a better idea had, um, with greater thought to have them, to have had them come later. Uh, but, um, and I don't know how long these issues will take to be addressed. Uh, um, I think uh, with the, the two law firm witnesses out of the gate, I think, um, you know, once you're, the court has, uh, you know, we could do, you know, some very, focused uh, in camera testimony um, and I think that for those witnesses uh, you know the court can then rule on what's admissible and what's not and once that's done uh, then we can get underway with the jury for those witnesses and and you know proceed accordingly uh, and then of course um, we can certainly have a discussion as far as other witnesses and then perhaps arrange a time to do any other in camera but I think setting the table with these two witnesses is going to set the table for many of the issues uh, that, you know, whether they're in or out, um, that the court has to decide. All right. Well, first, as relates to Rule 404, <clears throat> and Rule 404B states that evidence of other crimes or wrongs is not admissible to prove the character uh, of a person in order to show action in conformity therewith, in other words, not admissible to, uh, to show propensity uh, to, to commit the crime or a crime, but it may be admitted for certain other reasons, including motive, identity, uh, intent, and, the, uh, and, and perhaps the existence of a common scheme or, or plan. Um, Additionally, um, well, I'll address it later regarding race geste, but um, my view of the evidence is that uh, evidence of the other alleged crimes can be introduced in this case to show motive, uh, intent, uh, common scheme or plan given the proper analysis as it relates to that evidence being offered. Um, as I indicated earlier that the court agrees with the view and 
as expressed by the court in U.S. v. Siegel, um, 536 Federal 3rd 306, um, wherein the court uh, addressed the um, issue of previous crimes involving, uh, previous alleged crimes involving um, multiple victims and that um, the state should be able to um, pursue its theory of proving um, that uh, why um, suddenly or why some such uh, tragic, <laughs> the motive for such uh, tragic an occurrence to have taken place on the dates alleged here. Um, and under the federal rule, it goes on to say that evidence of other crimes uh, or bad acts is necessary if it is an essential part of the crimes on trial or where it furnishes part of the context of the crime. Uh, uh, this state has not adopted rule, that portion of rule 404B, but the courts have addressed that issue uh, in some of the cases, uh, particularly one that um, stands out to me as one of my cases State v. Frankie Lee McGee um, from Richland County in which the uh, race gestae, race gestae was used as a um, basis for the courts properly allowing um, certain evidence uh, including um, evidence of commission of, of an earlier crime um, the test being whether it logically relates to the crime with which the defendant is charged. Uh, court states in that opinion on the race just day that one of the accepted basis for the admissibility of the evidence of other crimes arises when such evidence furnishes part of the context of the crime or is necessary to a full presentation of the case, or is so intimately connected with and explanatory of the crime charged against the defendant and is so much a part of the setting of the case and its environment that its proof is appropriate in order to complete the story of the crime on trial by proving its immediate context or the race just day, or the uncharged offense is so linked together in point of time and circumstances with the crime charge that one cannot be fully shown without proving the other, and thus is part of the race just day of the crime charged. Uh, and, and where evidence is admissible to prove this full presentation of the offense, there is no reason to fragmentize the events under inquiry by suppressing parts of the race geste. <clears throat> and interestingly, involved in that case, the court held that that, that did not uh, require a, a 403 analysis. because the evidence was properly admitted as part of the race just day, the issue of whether or not a 404B analysis was done was not necessary. Or, uh, and at this point, the court hasn't um, addressed any particular issue under 404B, but I find that it is admissible uh, provided that the proper scrutiny is done in relation to clear and convincing evidence and a logical relationship um, to the offense for which we have, we're having this trial. 
And additionally, uh, as relates to intent, uh, evidence tending to prove a defendant's state of mind or intent at or near the time of the crime, of the crime is relevant uh, to establish possible guilt. So there are many uh, areas under which it's appropriate for the court to uh, consider admitting this evidence of, of other crimes, uh, other bad acts, uh, in a manner that does not uh, address or seek to have the jury conclude that it's propensity evidence, um, and the court will um, address all of that as we proceed. <clears throat> Yes, sir, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Your Honor. I, uh, I just want to get some arguments on the record for purposes. Yes, sir. Um, as, as to Your Honor's conclusion that we open the door by presenting evidence of good character, I would respectfully disagree, and the evidence that we presented was specifically limited to the relationship between the defendant and the victim for which he's accused of murdering. In our view, that is not character witness. That's a factual issue relating to the relationship between the parties. And so that, I just want to put that on the record. Your, Your Honor um, puts great um, emphasis and reliance on, on U.S. v. Siegel, and uh, that's a federal case. And I, and I just want, and I want to point out that. I gave the site, the federal site. Yeah. Yes, sir. Federal second. Yeah. Uh, the federal site is 536 F3rd 306. F3rd, yes. Yes, sir. And the um, and it's important to to distinguish the federal crimes for which the defendant in Siegel was on charge was charged with. First, he was, the defendant she was charged with murdering um, the victim to prevent him from reporting fraud, and that's a specific federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 1512. A1C. He's also charged with impending an official investigation by transporting the defendant's, I mean, the deceased body across state lines. But further, the indictment alleged a broader scheme and artifice to defraud. And in the indictment, it listed many of the prior uh, crimes that the defendant committed in, in the federal indictment. And so, and under federal rule 404B, you can prove those up. And then there were others that the court considered they were related to the whole scheme and artifice to defraud. The indictment in this case, Your Honor, is, is simply on, a, on June 7th, 2021, the defendant with malice of forethought murdered Ms. Ms. Maggie Murdoch, murdered Mr. Paul Murdoch, and used violent weapons in commission of, of an of those two crimes. There's no scheme and artifice to defraud you're, here. You're currently addressing it as if the court ruled based on 404. Well, that, you, and, and the court clearly stated that we have not reached any um, determination on 404 that the basis of the court's ruling was 403, um, the, uh, the boating, case as you you introduced through the witness um, and opening the door uh, to by giving testimony soliciting testimony of um, generally good character of the defendant uh, such that neither of the two witnesses could possibly imagine the scenario under which um, what would cause this crime to, uh, to have occurred, and the state is entitled to um, confront that evidence in the manner in which the court ruled. But you're arguing 404. I, I cited that for an additional basis to say the court will need to look at all of that as we proceed with um, evidence of prior uh, bad acts, but the basis of the court's ruling um, was not 404, but 403, opening the door and uh, responding uh, to the evidence that you adduced. 
Yes, sir. I, and I, I apologize. Mis I misunderstood. The, yes, sir. Your Honor's. Uh, I did not rule based on rule, U.S. v. Siegel and overruling your objection yesterday. Fair enough. I, I'll, I guess I would ask for clarification of where we go from here. Does it, is is your, your intentions to have a, a hearing outside the presence of the jury on their proposed 404B evidence? Yes, sir. Okay. Then I can save all the arguments from then. Thank you. Yes, sir. And again, with regard to planning purposes for the jury, you have, you said, a, a witness Whatever, whatever can be done without getting into the 404 or the court's need for an in-camera hearing um, where we have need to dismiss the jury for whatever period of time that might be, uh, we can press on with what you have otherwise at this time. And whatever that is, is what we'll hear. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Like I say, we have one short custodian, and then I think our next witness who's here would be uh, uh, somebody where we would need to address some of the 404. That would be uh, Jeannie Seconder from the law firm. Uh, if you give me one moment, I can uh, to confer with my staff and we can see if we can get some other people rolling so that we can kind of stagger that and, and continue to have uh, presentations for the jury uh, during the course of the day. All right. <clears throat> minutes. Are you ready to proceed? Uh, yes, sir. We do have, again, that custodian witness. Uh, then I think we would have to, uh, we, we are rolling some additional witnesses, but I think at that time we would have to break and do at least the first in-camera witness. Again, I think that may set the table for a lot of, uh, of subsequent things. Uh, and then we can have some additional work outside of any uh, 404 stuff uh, in the afternoon, uh, Your Honor. Uh, but certainly happy to to do that, or if you want, we can put up some multiple witnesses on the in-camera uh, here today. So I think as it relates to each um, alleged um, bad act, uh, it must be, a, a, the court must be informed and proper and, and um, addressed separately. Of course, some may be a series of things occurring almost simultaneously, so that may be a different scenario. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. We're ready to proceed with the jury. Yes, sir, Your Honor.
luxurious presence, sir. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Day number nine. State's case, you may call your next witness. Thank you. State call Heidi Galore. Take a seat in the witness stand. State your name again for the record. Spell your last name, please. My name is Heidi Galore. Last name is spelled G-A-L-O-R-E. Please call. Uh, good morning. Good Where do you work? Good morning. I work for SNAP Incorporated. What are your duties there? I'm an operation, uh, law enforcement operations lead, so I... Um, assist with and help manage a team of folks who respond to law enforcement legal process. Uh, oh, sure. uh, our team uh, responds to legal process submitted to our uh, company, subpoenas, search warrants, that kind of thing. All right. So you're in charge of responding to search warrants or subpoenas from law enforcement or other legal entities? Correct. All right. And briefly, please, what is Snapchat? Snapchat, uh, it's an application um, that was uh, created by Snap Incorporated to help uh, people express themselves. Uh, it's, people can connect to their friends, people they know, and um, I guess you could consider it a social networking type of uh, application. Is social media uh, another word that could be used for Snapchat? Yes. Uh, does it give the ability for individuals to send each other messages? Yes. Does it give uh, the ability for individuals to send each other pictures or videos? Yes. Uh, and uh, in the normal course of this business, does uh, Snapchat keep records uh, if the user so uh, chooses? Yes. What kind of records does Snapchat keep? Uh, basic subscriber information, uh, content that was sent to and from folks. Um, IP logs, geolocation, depending on the settings of the user. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit uh, 305 and 304. I'm going to ask if you recognize these two items. I do. Yes. And what are you holding? Um, the paper here is the uh, basic subscriber information for the user that was produced in the search warrant. And what's, what's that CD? Uh, the CD contains the full production of files that was um, sent to your agency uh, requested from the search warrant. All right, and that was a, a search warrant uh, from SLED? Yes. That Snapchat responded to? Correct. Okay. Uh, and you said there was subscriber information on that piece of paper, correct? Yes. And is that... Uh, uh, also located on the CD in the digital records? Yes, yes. And Your Honor, at this time, state we move uh, these injections. No objection, Your Honor. Is there a minute without objection? Uh, I'm going to hand you back states uh, 304. Uh, and you said you indicated that was uh, subscriber information, is that correct? Correct. Uh, and uh, can you read for the jury the subscriber information for? The information on the account that you provided uh, to in response to the search warrant. Sure. Uh, the username is listed here. Um, as, the username is listed here as Paul nine four nine nine. Common spelling for Paul. Uh, the email address listed here is Paul Murdaw seven eight four five at gmail dot com. Uh, this was created. The account was created on Saturday, May eighteenth, uh, twenty thirteen. There's a, a creation IP, but it's not listed here. Um, sometimes it's captured at the time of creation of the account. In this case, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, phone number listed here is 803-842-7845. Uh, Display name is listed as Paul Murdaugh, and the status is active. Okay. And when somebody uses a telephone number, for example, to create a Snapchat account, does Snapchat verify that number? Uh, if the user wants to verify the phone number, yes, they can, but it's uh, it's not um, it's not required. Okay. And what about the uh, email? Is that required? Not required either. No. 
All right, I'm going to hand you State Exhibit uh, 306. This is already in evidence. Uh, and I believe this is a CD. Uh, do you recognize that CD? Yes, I do. And have you reviewed the contents of that CD? Yes, I have. And what is on the contents of that CD? It's a video of um, a subject near a tree, and it's um, a short video with some audio. Okay, and did that video, uh, was that part of the full search warrant return uh, that we just talked about? Yes. All right, and did you take a look at that video uh, and the records contained in, in the, the other CD to determine when that video was first uploaded and first sent? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, first of all, let's talk about uh, the upload. Was it uploaded to something called Memories? Yes. Um, and can you describe to the jury what, what is Memories? What is that function with uh, Snapchat? Uh, memories is kind of like a bucket where you can save your uh, data. You can either create a video or some sort of photo on the app itself and save it to your memory so that it's always there um, when you need it. Or you can upload from your camera, your phone, um, into memories uh, to then send to, to, to folks later or just have it in there. So is that a form of uh, saving, like some, saving something in the, in the cloud? Correct, yes. Yeah, so it'll be on the server. All right. And in reviewing these records, did you determine when this account uploaded that particular video to Memories? Yes. Uh, this, this video was first seen on Memories um, on June 7th, 2021, at um, 7.39 hours okay. Eastern. And did the Snapchat also keep a record when an individual sends out uh, a communication? Yes. Uh, and did you determine in reviewing the records whether <coughs> excuse me, that account sent out that particular video? Yes, it was sent on the same day, June seventh, twenty twenty one, at twenty three. Or I'm sorry, uh, seven fifty six hours Eastern time. All right, thank you. Uh, and I'm going to show you. If you look at your monitor in front of you, and I'm going to show you States Exhibit three hundred six, and see if you recognize it. And did you recognize that video? It didn't show up on the... Oh, I'm sorry. Can we get the... Uh, get on the screen? My apologies. Oops. Okay. So on up. Uh, try it again. That. Can you see the uh, uh, what's on your screen right now? Yes. All right. And I'm going to play that one more time. Okay. And do you recognize that video, ma'am? Yes, I do. All right. And is that video, uh, the video we just discussed, that was part of the Snapchat search warrant return? Yes. That, uh, that you just testified was uh, uploaded at 7.39 p.m. and sent at 7.56 p.m.? Yes. No further questions. Good morning, ma'am. Morning. Uh, can we pull up the Snapchat video and just have it frozen on a screenshot? So this is what, or part of what Snapchat gave to the state on July 6th is that, of 2021, is that correct? Correct. So they, the state had this on July 6th, 2021, in the state's possession? I believe so, yes. This information. And you testified that this was uploaded at 7.39 p.m. on uh, the 7th of June, correct? Correct. Um, is that exactly when this video was shot? I can't tell that information from the from the production um are you certain that's not something that could be told from the uh, perhaps the uh, metadata for the video file uh there was no metadata produced for this uh, for this production it wasn't requested so it wasn't produced 
So if someone were to right click on this video file and, and you know, where it has various metadata that pops up in the screen, would we see immediate created date? Um, I, I don't know. Well, I let's, know. let's see if we would. Uh, court's indulgence for a moment. See on the screen um, the the metadata for this file. Yes. And uh, does it say uh, June the seventh, twenty twenty one, at seven thirty eight p.m.? Yes. And so this this was shot uh, basically a minute before it was uploaded. Is that correct? It appears so. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry if that seems picky, but in this case, you know, every minute and every second, you know, can matter. Um, does uh, Snapchat keep a list of? And I might be getting the terminology wrong, friends or contacts that Paul would have had on Snapchat? Yes. Were, was that list produced? No. And why was that list not produced? It wasn't requested in this case. Uh, and you mentioned earlier geolocation data. Um, was mm -hmm. that produced? No, not in this case. And why was that not produced? Uh, I don't believe it was requested. Um, is it possible for, um, I, mean, I don't know how it works, for some or all of Paul's friends to have access to his location through the app? Um, yes, if his settings were, uh, yeah, if he, if he made his settings visible, his geolocation visible to his friends, yes. Um, and would that information about whether that was, um, uh, that setting was in place to allow that, is that something that Snapchat would have had available to produce? Uh, I'm not sure if this, if, I'm not sure about that. If, if we can see that it's actually turned on or off. No. And was that requested? No. No further questions, Your Honor. By the state. No, no, it's All right, thank you. Thank you. Step down. Yes, sir. Uh, the state's next witness would be Jeannie Seconder. Ladies and gentlemen um, of the jury, there are matters that must be addressed outside of your presence. I do not know uh, exactly how long it would take, but I do not like to have jurors sit in jury rooms just for long periods of time. So we're going to excuse you through the after, um, after you speak with the bailiff, we're going to uh, take a recess with the jury while we deal with these matters. Um, let's see now, you all have lunch coming at what time? Nobody knows. One o'clock, 115. All right, well, we won't need you before lunch. So uh, if you'll go to the jury room and wait for further instructions, but we'll be having you all take a break until around that time.
Proceed. State would call Jeannie Seconder. My name is Jeannie Seckinger, S-E-C-K-I-N-G-E-R. Ms. Seckinger, how are you doing today? I'm good. Good. Let me uh, fix this Elmo real quick. Uh, you understand we're here right now outside the presence of the jury for an in-camera hearing to determine the admissibility of some of your testimony. I do. And... Uh, just very quickly, if you would, uh, give us a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the background that I went in front of the jury unless uh, um, Your Honor would like, but uh, give us a little bit about your background and where you currently work, how that led to where you currently work. Okay. I graduated with a BS in accounting from USC, went to work in an accounting firm for a few years, then switched to industrial at Westinghouse. And in 1999, I came to work at PMPD, which is Peters Murdoch Parker, as a temporary bookkeeper. And that has grown over the years to the office manager, CFO, accountant, anything business and um, insurance and HR related. Yeah, and that's for, uh, for whom? For Peters Murdoch Parker, Al Stroth and Dietrich. Right, so that's PMPD? Correct. And that's the law firm that Alec Murdoch used to work for? Correct. Uh, is that have a different name now? We are now um, a new entity that's called Parker Law Group, LLP. All right. Um, so just very quickly, uh, you've already kind of said this, but go through uh, sort of the financial side of your job duties as it existed for PMPD back in the relevant time periods. Okay. So my, my financial duties are actually I have people under me that do the day-to-day -day processing of checks, but my duties are to balance and reconcile accounts provide financial statements, help with all tax um, documents, preparation of taxes, also um, prepared anything for um, any government census or surveys that we needed and anything HR related. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the financial structure of how PMPD works, if I could. And if you could explain that a little bit. Uh, are, um, are the, you know, people often think of lawyers as partners, but are they called partners under the employment agreement that everyone signed? No, we're called partners when we refer to each other as they're in the business, but for tax purposes, everybody was an owner, it was a C corporation, so everybody's shareholders. And within Peters Murdoch Parker, every employee was a salaried employee, including the partners. Okay. And um, did the, uh, the employment agreement that everyone signed require that uh, any fees or money generated by any partner or lawyer uh, by the firm had to go to the firm? It did. And explain to me how, if you're a, and let's just call them quote partner, if you're a partner, how does the compensation work? What are the elements of compensation as it worked uh, under the PMPD structure back in 2021? So every partner received a base salary that they would receive in biweekly payments throughout the year. Um, that was set at a level of about $125,000. The majority of their pay came through an end of the year bonus, which is when we closed out the books and settled on the books. And primarily after overhead and over expenses were met, the net profit was divided amongst those partners. And in a simplified form, it was basically distributed based on a ratio of the fees that they brought in in percentage to the total. Right. But that distribution would not take place until when? Usually the last week of December. Right. Yes, sir. Waters, I, does, does the strike, can you re repeat the previous question for me? Yes, sir. Uh, going back to the second year, we were talking a little bit about the compensation structure for PMPD as it existed in 2021. And if you could, again, explain to the court 
how that worked. How are partners, and we're going to call them loosely that term, how are they compensated? Okay. Partners are employed salaries who are paid a biweekly bi paycheck throughout the year with a base salary of $125,000. And at the end of the year, they received a bonus check, usually in the last week of the year, that divided up the remaining profits of the firm based upon the percentage of revenue each attorney brought in to the total. All right, so when fees came in, they're going to be attributed to a particular lawyer, and ultimately that's going to be a percentage of the total revenues, and that's going to determine their percentage of the compensation at the end of the year after all overhead is paid. Correct. Is there also some sort of 7.5% fund or fee or something like that, or not? or amount that's put aside? There is. Um, you would take the gross bonuses that are the gross fees everybody brought in, less an overhead, and once we get to that number, everybody would throw in a pot 7.5%, and that money was divided back equally among the employees. And then a new percentage was arrived at to determine how much everybody would receive of the net income. All right, so you have to take care of overhead, right? Yes. And what is, what is an overhead, just generally? Overhead is just basically the expenses to run the business, what it costs us to advance client costs, what it costs to pay our employees, what it costs to rent the building, to provide equipment, office supplies, postage, et cetera. Right. And that's got to be accounted for, and then you got to account for this 7.5% as well, correct? That's right. All right, and then only after that does each partner get compensation based on their relative contribution during that year. Correct. All right. um, is the typically the vast majority of compensation received by a partner at PMPED received in that distribution at the end of the year? Yes. And when does that take place? The last week of the year, generally speaking. Okay. And what is the point of that goal? Why do you want to sort of clear out all the money and clear the books? Um, so basically, the, we don't want to leave the money in there to be taxed by the corporation because it's a C corp entity. So the, the objective is to get it out to the partners and avoid double taxation. And so because of that, is it up to each individual partner to essentially manage the bulk of their compensation that's received in one lump sum during the course of the next year? Yes, they need to budget. Uh, all right, let me uh, show you what's uh, been marked for purposes of this hearing as States 310 and see if you recognize that document. Yes, this is the employment agreement each shareholder slash partner would have signed. Okay. And I just want to direct your attention uh, to um, number two, and, and uh, if you could uh, tell the court what that uh, provision to sign by all the partners says. It says the employee accepts such employment and agrees that the employee will devote the employee's entire time and endeavor to the employer's business. Right. And then um, number three, if you could read that to the court, please. Services for the benefit of the employer. All professional services rendered by the employer shall be rendered as an employee of the employer, and all proceeds and remuneration received, therefore, shall inure to the employer's benefit. Okay. Now tell me what that means. That means work. that all fees earned should come through payable to PMPD. All right. And so if a lawyer earns fees, is it appropriate at all for those fees to go directly to the lawyer as opposed to going through the law firm? No. Is that a hard rule to understand? No. Anybody ever have a problem with that rule or not understand it? No. Pretty, pretty easy and hard and fast rule in that firm, correct? That's right. If you get the money written straight to you, what is that? The money taken straight to you? Yeah. That would be stealing it. Stealing it. Could you see that in the seconder? Yes. All right. So uh, two and three are the provisions you were just referring to? That's correct. Um, <clears throat> tell me just a little bit of your observation. How long have you known Alec Murdoch? Let me ask you that. I've known Alec since I was in high school, so roughly 40 years. 
And how long have you worked with him, or did you work with him? About 23, 24 years, <laughs> since 1999. And uh, did he have a lucrative practice in, in your observation? Yes, he did well. Was he sometimes getting as much as seven figures in the end of the year? He has. Um, are you familiar with what's been uh, called the boat case? Yes. And tell me what your understanding of the boat case is, just generally. What, what was that? Um, generally speaking, it was an accident that several children got in one evening where it was in Paul's, or the Murdoch's boat. Paul was accused as the driver, and there were a lot of civil suits and some criminal proceedings going on related to that crime. And following the uh, boat case, is it your understanding that uh, Paul Murdoch was charged? Yes. Is it your understanding that Alec Murdoch was civilly sued? Yes. And there was ongoing civil litigation at the time Paul and Maggie were murdered? That's correct. Um, after the boat case happened, did you and Alec ever have any discussions about uh, structuring fees? We did. We did in late May of 2020, 2021. Um, okay. Right about the end of the month, we had some discussions about Hirschberger. A, a disbursement came through that he had tried to send his fees to a structured settlement. And the conversation was that he had done it improperly because for to structure fees properly, it has to be part of the release. It has to go straight from the insurance company, straight to the insurance structured annuity place. and. Um, we would need to be told about it in our firm so we could account for it in our seven and a half percent. But in this particular case, Alec had sent the money directly to Forge. Um, we discussed the fact that it would not be any tax benefit to him. And at that point in time, he said he was not really worried about the tax benefit of it. And he said he was trying to put some money in Maggie's name due to the boat wreck, and that he was trying to figure out if he was going to structure fees for the future. Okay. Did he say he was trying to do a favor for anyone, too? He did say he would, had been he was friends with Michael Gunn, and the, who is the owner of, or one of the operators of Forge, and that he was going to try to put up to about $250,000 into a structure as a favor for Michael Gunn. All right. When you say Forge, what are you talking about? So Forge is a company that does structured annuities. Um, you know the full name real quick? It's Forge Consulting. All right, let's call it Forge Consulting. Okay, we'll Forge Consulting. All right, yeah. about Forge Consulting and um, they are. They're a company that will do structured annuities for clients. They'll do structured fees for attorneys. They do some wealth management. Um, they do minor pool trust. They have several different things that they do. I think they've branched out into insurance coverage now. To provide a lot of financial tools. Now, when you say that you uh, had a conversation with him about him supposedly structuring fees, how did this come to your attention? It came to my attention over the fact that a disbursement, my um, one of my secretaries or my my assistant brought to me that had been brought to her attention by Alex's secretary or paralegal Annette Griswold and came and asked me if this was proper and then came to me after the fact and that's when I went and had conversations with Alec about this. Okay. And so had the money already been paid? Yes. And you went to Alec and you asked what's this about? Yes. And he said I'm doing what? I'm trying to defer and put money into Maggie's name and structure some fees. Did he tell you where or did he where that money had gone? What was your belief where that money had gone after you talked to Alec? My belief was it had gone to Forge Consulting. The real entity yes. Forge Consulting. Yes. All right. I'm going to show you just real quick what's been marked for purposes of this hearing is States 311 and see if you recognize uh, that series. I think there's four documents in there. Yes, these are the Hirschberger um, settlement documents, which is the case that we're talking about, the fee that he sent as a structure. Okay. And are there one or two in there ultimately? There are ultimately two. There's one that's structured to look like fee, and then the other one was structured to look like it was client's money that was being sent on the client's behalf. Which one were you aware of at the time? I was aware of the fee one for the 
$333.33. All right. At the time, did you think that any money had been misappropriated or stolen, or did you just think Alan was trying to sort of uh, divert some money because of the boat case, but not necessarily anything misappropriated at that right. time? We were not thinking about him misappropriating funds or stealing any client funds. What we were concerned about was he was trying to either defer income by leaving it in somebody's trust or either trying to put some money into Maggie's name to avoid things for the boat accident. Concern. Who's concerned? Myself and some of the partners. Why are y'all concerned about him potentially trying to put money in a structure or in Maggie's name because of the boat case? Well, because that would be wrong and we did not want any part of that. recognize this document right here excuse me yes that's the document that is in question with the $83,333.33 cent fee sent to forge all right and right there and tell me what this disbursement sheet is very quickly explain that to the court so this is a, um, a where the client recovered two hundred fifty thousand dollars you can see it came from three different insurers and we would take a portion of our fee. Generally, this looks like a third, and our expenses of 9,300. The Sedgwick claims would have been a lien that we were playing off, and then the 140,678.55 would have been the money dispersed between the beneficiaries of that estate. And what is this line right here? That would represent the fee. Right. At this point in time, had you actually seen the check that was? Uh, that was made out for those fees? I don't recall if I actually looked at it at that point in time. Right. And normally fees, where would they go? If they, if normally if fees would come to us and we would deposit them to our income account, what we call our income account. Okay. So fees come in from somebody who pays a settlement, where do they go initially? To, what account to, do they go in? To, to the income account, the PMPD operating income account. Fees go in there? Yes. All right. When a settlement comes in, where does it go? It goes in a client trust account for the and, benefit of the client. And then the portion of that that is allocated for fees, it goes from the trust account to where? To the income account. Okay. It usually doesn't go out to Forge Consulting or anything like no. that? No. All right. After you had that conversation at Alec, did you follow at that time, did you follow up any more on the matter? We had a couple of conversations about it in relation to some other, when we were having some other conversations, but we didn't really readdress this again until late September, or late August, early September. Uh, did you kind of put it on the back burner? I did. I put it, I was, at that point, it had been done, and I was trying to figure out how we were going to account for it on our books, and just kind of had it out there as a reminder to try to see to put in my mind later to see if anything else had been done like that or to see if he was going to try to do that again. After that particular event, you said that was in late May sometime? You're right. Did uh, another matter come to your attention about disbursements as it related to Alec Murdoch's practice and his business? It did. And tell me what that was, please. So on, um, this was a case called the Ferris versus Matt Truck case. And on a Monday, I believe it was May 24th, Annette Griswold called me and said that she had something she needed to discuss with me. I was out of the office that day in our Walterboro office, but when I returned, we met. Um, and when she showed me, she, the, what had happened was we received a check for our client expenses. So this case was actually dispersed by the associated attorney, which was Chris Wilson. So he sent us a check for the money that we had forwarded as client expenses, but we did not receive a fee check. And that is in itself is odd, generally. And Gen why is that odd? Why didn't that call you? Because y'all had received a fee check from Alex's best friend, Chris Wilson, but not the, uh, excuse me, the expense check, but not the fee check. Right. Most of the time we receive them together. Well, 
Annette, when she did not receive them together, called my assistant, Nicole, to make sure we had not already received the fee, verified that we had not already received the fee, and at that point, Annette had some conversations with Vicki Lyman in Chris's office, and Vicki informed Chris that their bosses had already got the fee when the settlement was signed, which had happened in March, and this was May. And Vicki informed Chris or Vicki informed Annette? Vicki informed Annette of that. So why is that a concern to you that now you're hearing the fee's already been paid? Because now we know we don't have the check. We've never received it. So either he's got a fee, he, either he's got a check he hasn't turned into us that is properly payable to PMPD, or he's received a check payable to him. All right. And when you are considering the possibility that he perhaps received a check payable to him, aside from that being stealing, as you earlier testified to it, what's your concern then? saying that he's trying to hide money from the boat rack. Hide money from boat rack. Right. All right, stand by for me. been marked as, uh, for the purposes of this hearing as Exhibit 312 and see if you recognize this document. Yes, this is the actual the expense check that we received in the Ferris matter Okay, and from, uh, from Wilson Law Group. Just quick flip through it and just tell me generally what that what's in that packet. The rest of the packet is our um, deposit which is an internal record. Our cost client cost report which matches that expense check then the rest of it the second what I'm looking at right now is a check made payable to Richard Alexander Murdoch Esquire for $192,000 and it references Ferris fees okay keep going um, Next page is the deposit where it says Bank of America deposit only and it looks like ACH that looks like it's, it actually looks to me like LX initials and then it says Bank of America. Is there a series of emails after that? Series of emails starts with Vicki Lyman informing Annette Griswold about the fact that their bosses had received the fee back when the disbursement was signed. All right, let me put those emails up uh, on the screen. I believe there's no objection versus this hearing. All right. So this is an uh, email, and Annette Griswold, explain to uh, the judge who Annette Griswold is, please. Annette Griswold is one of Alex's um, primary paralegals. Okay. And Right here, this is an email that was ultimately sent to you as, as part of bringing this to your attention? Yes. All right, and what is she asking right there? She said, why just expenses and no fee? All right. All right, and what was the response there? Dear friend, it is only cost because your boss and mine and Liz's got their fees once they were signed. Okay. So Annette's informing you that Chris Wilson's office says they already got the fees. Correct. All right. All right. Um, after that, did you have a conversation with Annette what to do? I did. I actually talked with Lee Cope. We um, went to Lee. Sometimes a lot of the partners are not in the office, and Lee Cope was the one who was in the office. So I went to talk to Lee about what we should do. Um, and, of course, Annette was worried about getting, you know, ramifications if she was wrong and didn't want to be in trouble. So Lee and I decided to take it over from there. And the course of action that we decided upon was that I would send an email to Annette requesting the disbursement, the supporting documents, and the general ledger printout from Chris Wilson's office, which is what we keep in our office. All right. And if we go right here, can, is that the email you're speaking of right there? That is. All right. What's the date on that? May 27th. All right, and so then what happens to that email from there if we look over to the next page? So um, apparently Vicki in Chris Wilson's office was on vacation. So on June 2nd, 
um, Annette clarifies with Vicki what exactly we were looking for. And again, she asked for the full disbursement paperwork, including the disbursement sheets, expenses, supporting docs, and ledger. All right, and you're included on that email? I am CC'd, yes. Okay. All right, did y'all uh, ultimately get a response on that? Um, Vicki responded that she would have to send that email to Chris because she did not have privy to that information. Um, so that was on the second. The next day, Ellie came into my office early and asked me why I needed that information and assured me that the money was in Chris Wilson's account and that they could get it any time. Okay. And uh, did y'all discuss any fur anything further when you had that conversation? Just that we needed to get it or I needed proof that we that it was there, that it was necessary to get it. At that point, I didn't indicate to him that I thought it was missing. I was just asking for the documentation. And that was on what day? It was some sometime in between June 2nd and June 7th. Okay. All right. Um, on June 7th, did the issue come back to a head? The issue did come back to heads. So just clear, this is June 7th, 2021. This is, yes, yes. And how much were these fees supposed to be, did you know? $792,000 in total. And to this point, the firm had not received those fees, is that correct? That's correct. And Chris Wilson's office is saying, initially, we already dispersed them. Yes. Right. And Chris Wilson's not saying anything to me. Was, uh, to your knowledge, was an inquiry made to Chris Wilson at that time? Lee Cope, we had not inquired Chris Wilson other than requesting this information at this point in time. All right. So tell me about June 7th. How does that go? So on June 7th, I was going to make another run at finding out from Ellick if we had their information. Um, I went upstairs to his office is on the second floor, and he was on a, leaning on a file cabinet outside his office. And he turned and looked at me when I came up and said, what do you need now? And gave me a very um, dirty look, not a look that I'd ever received from Alec from, just kind of frustrated with me look, which made me go, oh, you want to know, let's go in your office. So we went in the office and closed the door, and at that point I told him that I had reason to believe that he had received the funds himself and that I needed proof that he had not. He received those fees himself? Yes. And I needed proof that, that they were not? Yes. What did he tell you? He told me again that he assured me that the money was there and that he could get it. And at that point, I said, I know, I said, I'm just trying to do my job, and if I don't get this paperwork and verify that with these questions, I'm not doing my job. He actually acted like he respected that, and again said that that money was there, and that he again was trying to decide what he was gonna be doing with it. And did y'all get to conclude that conversation, or just something interrupted? We did not. He took a phone call in the middle of that conversation, that phone call was about his father that was in, who was in the hospital, that he was going to be terminal, and that there was nothing else they'd be able to do for his father. So that changed the mood of the conversation. We quit talking about business, and I immediately asked about him and his family and his dad, and you know, we got talking as friends at that point, concern over the family. And after that, I shortly left, so it briefed and cut down the conversation. All right. You'd come in there asking for proof where that money was because you had believe in, reason to believe he took it, and then the conversation ultimately got short by the call about his father. Yes. Uh, did you have a conversation later in the day with Alan? I did. Around 4 o'clock, my phone rang, and um, I remember that because I, I had been under the impression Alec was going to leave and go to the hospital or leave to deal with his father. And around 4 o'clock, my office extension rang. And at that point, he was asking me for some information on his 401k balances because he stated he was working on some financials for the hearing on the boat accident that was later in the week. There was a hearing later in the week, and yes. he was working on financials for the boat accident. Correct. Did that strike you as odd? That he called and asked me? Yeah. No, he had asked me before. So, and he, I would be the one to give him the 401k. So it didn't surprise me that he's calling him and asking me about that. But I was surprised that he was in the building working on it. Now, why was that? I just thought he was leaving a deal with his father. Because that interrupted the prior conversation. That's right. Um, was that the last conversation you had with him? It is. Um, when did you find out about the murders? 
I initially found out through the rumor mill around 10.30 or 11 o'clock the evening of them, but I did not get confirmation until I received a text from the partner roughly 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Were you shocked by that? Yes. Scared? Yes. Worried? Yes. Worried for Alec? Worried for everybody, yes, especially Alec. Um, in the wake of the murders, do you know if the hearing that was later that week got canceled? It did get canceled. That was a hearing in the boat, boat case where he's personally a defendant? That's my understanding, yes. In the wake of the boat case, did you and the partners have a discussion about what to do about getting to the bottom of these Ferris fees? We did. We did not the week of the murders because pretty much our office shut down the week of the murders and then his father also passing away. But when we got back around to it, Lee and Mark Ball and I were the ones doing the discussion. Lee decided that he would call Chris Wilson himself directly and try to get the information, and Lee took over from there. In the wake of the murders, did anyone want to bring that up to Alec again? Mm, no, nobody wanted, Alec was distraught and upset and not in the office much, and nobody wanted to, to harass him about nothing that we thought was really missing. We had several months till the end of the year to clear it up, so we were not going to harass him at that point in time. Uh, so that part just got stopped in his tracks, is that true? Yes, Lee took over calling Chris Wilson and trying to pursue it. All right, and when was that? You said in July sometime? Yes, probably early July. All right. And what was the result of that? Um, Lee said, and you, you could speak to him more clearly, but Lee said Chris Wilson got off the phone pretty quick with him, which was surprising because apparently Chris Wilson has the gift of gab. Um, but again, Chris assured Lee that it was there. All right. Ultimately, did y'all get an email about that, this particular issue? We did. Ultimately, on July 19th, there was an email from Chris to Alec stating that the money was in Chris Wilson's trust and would have been available any time that we requested it. That email was forwarded to Lee Cope and myself. Okay. From whom? From Alec. And what, uh, is that the email up on the screen that you're talking, that you're talking about right now? It is. All right. And uh, we see 600000 for Andrew Ferris and 192 for Denise. What, what's, explain that breakdown, if you would, please. So there's um, two, two parties in this case, and apparently there was two recoveries, and each of them would have had a fee dependent upon their recovery. So to me, this looks like Andrew's portion, the fee for his settlement was 600000 and Denise's was 192000 At this point in time, had the firm received this $792,000? No. Uh, did this uh, email, though, sort of end the inquiry, at least for the present moment? Yes. Um, all right, well, let's move the story forward again. Uh, did this matter ever come to your attention again at a later time? Yes. All right. And how, tell me when that came to your attention. That would have been in September um, after we found some other misappropriations and we had confronted Alec and he had resigned. We ended up having more conversations with Chris Wilson right after that and Chris admitted that he did not have all the money. Well, let me, let me back it up. Before we get to there, I'm talking about as far as it relates to Alec, did this particular issue with trying to get the Ferris fees come to your attention? And let me take you to early September of 2021. No, not that I recall. Okay. In early September 2021, did uh, the Hirschberger matter that you mentioned earlier, did that come back to your attention? That came back to my attention. I started pursuing that and decided I was going to go through and look and make sure that he had not tried to already defer something else that we had missed. And at that point, I decided to print a, a ledger print out of our system of payments to forge. And as I did that, I started printing all the documents that would relate to those disbursements, the disbursement statements and the canceled checks. And as I started printing the canceled checks off, I could see Bank of America on the back and Alec Murdoch's signature. And every one that came out was just put it a little bit more in the grave for me. Um, that's when I found that out, I had William Barnes come over, who was a partner who was in there in the office that day and had him look at them 
he also believed that they were that they were Alex signatures on the back of these checks. Right, and just real quick, these are checks coming from the client trust account. Yes. And they're made out to what? Forge. But what's what's unusual to you that's causing you to have that feeling that you just described? Um, the the endorsement and the Bank of America on the back, and the fact that it looked like Alex signature. Okay. All right. And so you talked to William Barnes, is that right? Yes. And uh, did you talk to other partners about what you were finding? We did. We, William and I then called Mark Ball, who had been aware of this situation the whole time. Mark Ball was the treasurer, so he came back into the office. We showed him the signatures. He agreed with us, and he also recognized one of the disbursements as a case that could not have possibly been dispersed yet because it was held up waiting some court orders for a workers' comp lien. We also talked to Lee Cope that night about it, and Lee, we, we came to the plan for Lee to call Michael Gunn with Forge and see if they had banked at Bank of America. And they had, Michael Gunn confirmed that they had not banked at Bank of America in a number of years. Did y'all send them a list of uh, clients, uh, the ones that you were pulling off of your system that had payments to forge at Bank of America? We did. We gave them a few names that evening, not the complete list. We gave them a few names that we had, and he verified that those, to Michael Gunn verified to Lee Cope that those were not any structures or any nudies and they didn't have records of them. All right, uh, around this time, did Annette bring you anything and that this is all going on? Yes, so this is completely independent and coincidental. Annette, the same afternoon of September 2nd, was in his office trying to look for something, and when she moved a file, a check fell out. When the check fell out, she looked down, and it was Chris Wilson, and it was the $225,000 check payable to Richard Alexander Murdoch that we had already found. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit uh, 313 uh, states for purposes of this hearing. You recognize that? That is. That's the check. This is the actual check that was found. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Hold on for me real quick. Got an endorsement on the back. Let me ask you this. You've worked with Alec Murdoch for how long? 23 years, roughly. During that time, did you become familiar with his handwriting? Yes. Can you recognize it when you see it? Yes. Looking at the handwriting, the endorsement on the back of that document, do you recognize it? That's his signature in the handwriting. What are the copies of these various exhibits for the court? Uh, yes, sir. Your Honor, if you'll just give me one second, I'll hand uh, the exhibits we're talking about up to the court as, as well. Uh, but up on the screen, is this the check? Yes. Yes. And then on the back, whose writing is that? Alex. Um, once we, once you started printing out all those Forge ones that had Alex writing on it in Bank of America and you contacted Forge. Did you ask them whether or not they ever banked uh, the real Forge, if they ever banked a Bank of America? Lee Cope had that conversation and Michael Gunn verified that they had not banked there in a number of years, more they, than 10 years. And they didn't have any active structures on any of the clients that y'all had given them? That's correct. As a result of that, what did the leadership at the firm do next? We convened a meeting on the morning of Friday, September 3rd at Lee Cope's house with the majority of the partners and myself present. We discussed what we had found and showed everybody the documentation that we had recovered. 
and then the choice was made. Randy was not present initially. The choice was made to bring Randy in and show him what we had found. And after Randy was brought in and showed what, what was found, what happened next? Um, Randy immediately conceded that we needed to, to talk to Alec, that it looked like he had stolen. And Danny and Randy got together and met with Alec outside of the office. Run him with this information? They did, and it is my understanding that Alec admitted it and that it was determined he would resign. Okay. Did he ask for a leave of absence? To your I think he tried to do a few other things before resigning, but we, we made him resign. Um, after the decision was made to resign. Was it announced right away, or was there any statement put out or anything like that right away? It was not announced right away because the decision was made. Johnny Parker was getting married the next day, and it was late on a Friday, and that we were going to kind of hold off until the first of the week. We were going to contact some ethics attorneys and see what we needed to do and announce it the first of the week. Um, So we're in the weekend, September 3rd, September 4th, something like that? Yes. Is that Labor Day weekend? Yes. What's the next thing you recall hearing about Alec? The next thing I heard about Alec was um, I was actually with my family on the sandbar, and the next thing I heard was Suzanne Peoples with the EMS came down and told me that Alec had been shot in the head and was being flown out to Savannah. Was that on the side of the road at Old Sokahatchee? That's correct. What's the first thing you thought when you heard he had been shot? You know, nobody knew what to think. A lot of thoughts went through, but fear went through. Was this retaliation? Was he involved in something bigger that was going to get more of us in trouble? And, and just fear. All right. Um, as the months went on after that, did y'all continue to review your records looking for additional misappropriations? We did. We immediately decided once we found this out on, on September 2nd and had the confrontation on the 3rd, we immediately started doing a dig into our books and proactively going to look for anything. And anything that we found, we turned over to law enforcement. We also had a forensic audit from an outside firm come in and provided information from them. So this took most of September gathering all this information and, and going through all of our stuff to figure out what else we had missed or what else had occurred. You've uh, already described the checks to the Forge account at Bank of America, which was a fake Forge account, is that correct? That's right. Um, was there another manner in which uh, Alec Murdoch misappropriated money that you uncovered in your review of the firm's records as CFO? Yes, we've also found out some payments made through um, Palmetto State Bank. Okay, and generally explain how those were working. So those were working, um, some of those Russell Lafitte was a conservator on and funds were directed to Palmetto State Bank as if they were going to be held for the beneficiary. And those checks were later converted into personal use for Alec. All right. And incidentally, the week after we um, of the the, the boat act, I mean of the roadside shooting, when we were going through stuff in Alec's office, we actually found Forge R. Alexander Murdoch doing business at Forge bank statements in his office. Okay, so you found the Bank of America bank statements? Yes. And the title on those bank statements was what? R. Alexander Murdoch doing business as Forge. Okay. I'm going to uh, get a document mark if I could real quick. Do the uh, client trust account checks, what color are they? Green. All right. And the uh, operating checks, are they a different color? Blue. Your Honor, 
14 for this hearing. This will be the spreadsheet that's in one of the folders in the packet I just gave you. It starts at the uh, top, um, the check date 12, 26, 18. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked as stage 314 for this hearing and see if you recognize that document. Yes, this is a spreadsheet that we've developed of the money and the clients that had money um, stolen using the forge payment method. All right. And by the forge payment method, you mean what? Um, basically, checks payable to forge that looked like they were going to be for a structured annuity on the behalf of the client. All right. And again, for the purposes of this hearing, in preparing that chart, you've been keeping a chart and keeping these records. Is that correct? That's right. Is this all the misappropriations, or is this focused just on some for purposes of, of a particular category? This is just for purposes of this particular category. And what category is that again? Forge. All right, I'm going to put this up on the screen. And just real quick, if you could uh, just go across and tell me uh, what the various categories represent, please. Excuse me. The categories, if you see the, the, the column with category, forged payment, those would be where checks were actually written to forge as if those were the beneficiaries' proceeds that were being sent for a structured annuity. Okay. The next line where it says Barrett Bulware took insurance proceeds, this is actually a check that was payable to Barrett, ben Barrett Bulware from Southern Fidelity Insurance. And Ellick actually endorsed that check. He had power of attorney on that file. He actually endorsed that check, and later we were able to trice it into his personal accounts. All right. If you keep going down, the majority of these are forged payment. If you get to Dion Martin, the first line says Before, fake. Just real quick, I'm sorry to interrupt okay. you. Just going across, though, we've got mm -hmm. the client, we've got the civil action number, we've got the category that you were just describing, mm -hmm. we got the date the trust was funded, and then we have the amount. Is that That's correct? right. And the date the trust was funded, what does that category refer to? That refers to when we found out and did the deep dive into exactly what had happened on each file and deposited the money back immediately into our client trust. So that's the firm actually, as we found these, put money in client trust. We then met with all the clients, reestablished what the correct disbursements should have been, and returned all funds to the clients. So the firm had to pay the money back that you've determined in each one of these cases that Alec Murdoch misappropriated through the fake forge on this list. We did. What's the uh, total amount? on this sheet? Two million eight hundred and forty one thousand five hundred and twelve dollars and fifty five cents. Right. And again, does this represent everything or just a particular category? Just a particular category. Just real quick, I see that it says one twenty nine eleven for Thomas Moore. Is that supposed to be twenty one? Yes. Okay. And that would be the, the date and the check number of the check that was taken. And exhibit 314 up to you. And if you could uh, correct that with my pen here and then just put your initials next to it, please. Going back to exhibit 314, if we look at all the check dates on here, we have the earliest one being about August of 2015, is that correct? That's right. And then it continues all the way up to early 2021, is that correct? That's correct.
spreadsheet that uh, was just marked. Have you also prepared some supporting document documentation for each one of those uh, transactions that, of misappropriation that you've identified? Yes, we have. And these are from the records and your investigation into the records at the firm? That's correct. And each one of these has the firm had to make the clients whole because of the defendant's misappropriation? We did. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as 315, and this is a particular case is Elise Mallory. And just as an example, and see if you recognize that document. I do. This first document is the um, disbursement which would have been drafted at the end of the case that states the recovery expenses fees and payments to clients um, next we have this one actually had a payment to forge so I have a copy of that canceled check and then the third and fourth pages are where we did our correcting disbursements with footnotes about what had happened and explained everything to our clients when we reimbursed them okay. let's uh, put that up on the screen real quick and there, are there similar documents, supporting documents for each one of these transactions that's on your spreadsheet? There is. All right. So this is a disbursement sheet, is that right? That's correct. And I didn't ask you, but very quickly, tell me what a disbursement sheet is and, and uh, how they're supposed to work. So a disbursement sheet just shows at the conclusion of a case, once the recovery, it will show the recovery amount, list out the fees that were sent to the attorneys, um, shows fee splits if there's multiple attorneys, shows the amount of expenses we collect back, any liens or loans that were payable that were in the scope of that case, and then the final amount would be the payment to the client or the client's beneficiaries if, if they had beneficiaries. All right. And then down here at the bottom of this particular one, do you recognize that signature? Yes, that's Alex. Okay. And Going to the second page, what is this right here? That is a copy of the check that was payable to Forge that you saw in the bottom line of that other disbursement, as well as the back of it showing the endorsement. All right. And is that the uh, real Forge or the fake Forge? That's the fake Forge. All right. And then what is this document right here? This is the correcting disbursement. The yellow totals would signify what the correct amount should have been and the corrections that would needed to have been made. All right, going back to this first page, in this particular one, uh, how much was the recovery? 100, $183,528. All right, and then did, was there an attorney fee taken from P PMPED? There was an attorney fee taken. In this case, it was $30,000, which was a reduced fee. We generally get a third or 40% but there are instances where the attorney will reduce their fee for some reasons. Right. And do you know why, the, who, who requested the fees be reduced in this case? That, that would be Alec would have done that. Right. Alec did that, and so, but those fees got paid to the firm from that recovery, correct? They did. All right, great. So the rest of that money went to the client, didn't it? It did not. It actually went to the fake forge account where Alec stole the money from the client. Every last bit of it. Every bit, the 152, 866. That, that client didn't get one dime until y'all had to make it right. That's right. And that's similar to the all, rest of the examples we have. It's here. exactly like the rest. Been going on for years. Yes. documentation like that for each one of these and they're in the packet up there I'm happy to go through all of those in the uh, with the witness I don't want to sell myself short if I need to I don't know if, if if the point for purposes of your honor is is made or if you would like me to go through each one uh, of those I'm happy to keep going uh, is this mr. Griffin is, is yours so you
everything, Miss um, Seconder. Miss Seconder, yes. Yeah. Seconder is. That from the spreadsheet, Your Honor, um, and then we're marking the supporting documentation, which I'll go ahead and mark. But I think with Ms. Seconder, we can kind of walk through each one and describe each one um, while we do that. Um, but they, each packet has, we've got this uh, spreadsheet that has each one on there, and then for each one of them, we tried to minimize it down to the bare minimum. And again, this isn't even all of, of the misappropriation. Um, but we just have a few supporting documents for each one, which is the disbursement sheet. Uh, the fake forged check, typically, and then the corrected disbursement sheet uh, that the firm had to do. That's generally what each packet has, uh, for example, like the one we last did. Is that correct, Ms. Sessions? That's correct. And so I, I can go through those quickly, and, and we can do that on the spreadsheet. And then we have one other category uh, that they uncovered of um, manner in which he was able to misappropriate money going back to, I think, 2008, 2009, something like that. You may proceed. Thank you. All right. Um, So, Your Honor, we're going through that packet that was provided up there with you, and we're, we're going to go in, in order except for Hirschberger, which we already talked about. Um, and so, Ms. Seconder, can you see okay on that screen there? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to just kind of move through these as expeditiously but as accurately as we can. Uh, first one, we have this uh, particular uh, client, uh, Ms. Adriana. Is that correct? That's right. <clears throat> All right. And I'm going to put uh, 317 up on the screen, and is this the disbursement sheet for that? That is the disbursement sheet for that, yes. All right, and down at the bottom, do you recognize the signature where it says attorney? That's Alex signature. All right, and would typically the attorneys meet with the clients and get them to sign these disbursement sheets before any disbursements were made? It's typically, we signed, we did the checks on the attorney's signature and then the attorney met with the client and had them signed at the same time they distributed and discussed the disbursement. Gotcha. All right, and then right here on this particular one, we have a total recovery amount of how much? $247,500. All right, and then the firm gets paid its fees out of that. And again, that looks like a reduced fee of $22,000. And what happens to the rest of the money? The two twenty five zero seventy three forty six went to a fake forge account that was for LX benefit. All right, and is that the check right there? That is. Whose signature is that right there? That's Alex. All right. And that's uh, 225 and change. And then you have the corrected disbursement sheet. Is that correct? That's correct. And this is where the firm had to make good on Alex's misappropriation. That's correct. All right. Let's move to the next one. This would be for Mr. Uh, Barrett using the first name. Is that correct? That's right, Barrett Bowler. All right, and just using the first name, we have this first one is uh, the 75193, is that right? That is the, the check I discussed earlier that was payable to Barrett that Alec endorsed directly and deposited into his account. All right, and I'm, gonna, I'm on the exhibit 318. We're going to the third page, but is this that check right here that was made out to Mr. Bulware? That is, and that was actually found as we went through his desk after September 3rd. And you recognize that writing right there? I can zoom in if you need to. That's, that's LX writing. All right. And this is the deposit slip went along with it? Yes. And what's the name right there? Alec Murdoch. All right. Going to the next one on, on the list, we have this one. And the amount is 279 850 Is that right? That's correct. All right. And we're still in Exhibit uh, 318. And this is the uh, disbursement sheet, the original disbursement sheet right there? That's correct. Whose signature is down at the bottom? That's Alec Murdoch's. And what does that say right there? $279,850.65. Is that they were forge. Fake forge or real forge? Fake. All right. And then what is that right there? That's the check payable to forge showing Alec signing it and endorsement on the back. Okay. 
All right, let's move on to the next one. We have, uh, this is Hershberger. We already did that one, correct? That's correct. Well, yeah, we already did that one. All right, let's go on, and we did the next two. Those were those two fees that Alec told you he was structuring? That's right. All right, or at least this one was, correct? That's right. All right, let's go on to uh, Ms. Gary. This is uh, States 319. This is the disbursement sheet right here. That is the initial disbursement sheet. Okay, and what is well, that right there? Uh, excuse me, that is not the initial, that's the second one. So there's a forward structure right there of 112.5, um, a payment of the personal rep and the amount divvied between the beneficiaries. That forward structure should have been paid to the beneficiaries, and again, it was paid to the fake forge account. All right, you see the check signed by Alec and endorsed by Alec. All right, so that's 112.5 right there, correct? That's right. And then you have the corrected disbursement where y'all had to make right to the clients. That's correct. All right. Moving on to the next one. We have Mr. and I'm going to use their first names. Use that for me if you can, please. Okay. All right, Mr. Christopher. Mm -hmm. All right, and we have uh, this. You have this uh, disbursement right here. Is that correct? That's right. And whose signature is that right there? Alec Murdoch. And we got how much? Seven hundred and fifty thousand. Going to what? Fake Forge. The Fake Forge. Is that correct? That's right. And then we have the check. That we do. And. Who's that? Uh, do you recognize that on the back? That is Alec Murdoch. Okay, and this is $750,000? That's correct. All right, and then we have uh, another uh, disbursement sheet where y'all had to correct it and make it right to the client? That's correct. Y'all had to pay back $750,000? We did. That Alex spent we client did. money? We did, he stole it. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, Dion Martin, we have three for Mr. Martin, is that correct? That's correct. All right, let's look at that. Uh, we have so you have a little new category here. You see it above where it says structured annuity directly to Michael Gunn for 500000 mm -hmm. and then it's offset by the proceeds structured annuity below. Mm -hmm. This would represent like there was an annuity associated with that case that had been properly structured and sent, and that resulted in there being a $200,000 fee taken on that $500,000 that should not have been taken from the client. So just a slight of hand with paperwork and Ella created a phantom 200, well, a real $200,000 in fees from, from thin air. That's right. All right. But that's not the end of this one, is it? No. Okay. All right. Right here on the second page, we have a disbursement to Forge. Is that correct? That's right. And is that real Forge or fake Forge? That's the fake Forge. How much is that one? Three hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars fifty-six cent, fifty-six dollars and fourteen cents. Okay. Now we already talked about on this list. We talked about the fake fee of two hundred thousand that you just mentioned. That's right. And we did the three thirty-eight zero five six. That's uh, right. Fourteen. Okay. Let's keep going. And what's that? That's the check for the $338,000 that's payable to the fake forge and endorsed by Alec. All right, and then what is this disbursement sheet? This one is showing a structured payment of $45,000, and this one incidentally had a quote attached to it and is signed by the client. And that also went to the fake forge account and his personal account. And this is a copy of the quote from forge. But no Ford structure was ever uh, materialized. No, none was done. We verified none was ever done. All right. And what is that $45,000 check there? This is the $45,000 check to the fake Forge deposited by Alec. And is this the disbursement sheet where y'all had to correct it and make it right to the client? Yes. Moving on to the next one. We have uh, Elise Mallory, and that's the one I showed you at the beginning as an example. Is that's that right. All right. So we've done that one, and that was... 183528 where he took every last dime of it. Is That's that correct? right. Yeah. All right, the last one I talked about was 321. The one before that was 320, and the one before that was 319. We are now on 322. Let me turn the page. And we have Mr. Jamian, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and uh, right here we've got a disbursement sheet, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and 
And uh, we have a forge of $90,000. That's correct. All right. And is that real forge or fake forge? Fake forge. Okay. And what is this right here sideways? That is the check payable to forge, the fake forge, and the endorsement on the back of the check. All right. All right. And then we have uh, an expense uh, disbursement right there of 5541.17. Is that correct? That's correct. And is that another amount that y'all had identified? We identified later that that was an incorrect charge to a client file, so we reimbursed that as well. Okay, and is this that page right here? Yes. And what did, uh, what did, what did Alec bill to the client that y'all determined was improper? Um, some airfare. To where? On a private flight. I can't recall, but I believe that one might have been down to the keys. They'll have to pay that money back too in this corrected disbursement. We did. That was exhibit 322. We got 333. Mr. Johnny, $95,000. Is that right? That's correct. All right, on the first page, we have the disbursement sheet and we have a forge uh, line right here for $95,000. That's correct. And did I go to the real forge or the fake forge? Fake forge. Okay. We have a copy of the check right there. Is that correct? That's the copy of the check and the endorsement right. and a copy of the correcting disbursement. Y'all had to make that right to the client? We did. Moving on to 324, uh, Mr. Jordan, we got a disbursement to Forge. Is that right? That's right. For $85,000 along with the fake check and the endorsement on the check. Okay. And then the corrected disbursement, correct? You missed the one for $65,000. There was two in that one. Yep, there it is right there. That's right. And there. then the correcting. All right. So we had an 85 and a 65,000 for that one, correct? Correct. Exhibit 325. This is uh, now Mr. Uh, Manuel. And we have a $70,000 forge, is that correct? That's correct. Fake forge? Fake forge. All right. And what's that right there? The check payable to forge the fake forge and the endorsement. And this is the correcting disbursement where we paid the client back that $70,000. Right. Going to the next one, we got uh, Miss Mary, and we got a settlement proceeds to forge of 19.5 right there, is that correct? That's correct. And this is exhibit 326. And did that got a real forge or fake forge? The fake forge. All right, and what is that right there? Copies of the check, the fake forge, and the endorsement on the back by Alec. All right, and then the corrected disbursement having to pay the money back? Correct. By the firm? All right, going on to Mr. Randy. Right here, we've got a disbursement of Nine, $9,569.30 on exhibit 327? Correct. All right, next page we have what? The copy of the check payable to the fake forge and the endorsement by Alec on the back of it. All right, and then the uh, correction disbursement? Correct. All right, and last one for this set is exhibit 328 and we have uh, Morris Mack, uh, excuse me, uh, Thomas Moore, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, whose signature is that right there? That is Alex. And the amount to forge of 125000 yes. is that right? Incidentally, that's a forge signature for, top, for the client. The client confirmed that when we met with them. Did you, do you recognize that handwriting? It appears to me to be Alex printing. On the disbursement sheet? Yes, sir. All right, and then we have the fake check right there? That's correct. Or the fake forge check, and then that's all on that one for right now, is that, that correct? Well, it's partial correction. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cases that Alec had? Fair amount? Well, we found them in these several cases, and in, in the scope of all cases, not so much. I mean, we have a ton of volume, so this doesn't represent a large proportion of those. 
but this was common with them. And that's my point, is yes. that there's a large volume, and yes. these are sprinkled throughout over years and years and years. Sprinkled out over a decade or better. Whenever there was an opportunity, it happened. Yes. All right. I'm going to uh, show you. Let me get a couple more documents, Mark. show you what's been marked as exhibit 329 here uh, to this proceeding and uh, see if you recognize that. I do. This is a spreadsheet of the payments that were made to Palmetto State Bank and misappropriated through that method. All right, you testified earlier that the fake Forge account, the Richard Alexander Murdoch DBA Forge started around 2015. Is that right? That's correct. But you just uncovered a different mechanism whereby Alec Murdoch misappropriated money from clients prior to that. Is that correct? That's correct. Most of these took place in 2011 2012. Okay. And did Alec have some particularly big cases in, in those years? He did. And what were those cases? So he had Arthur Badger, which was against a UPS truck in Allendale where a wife, his wife was um, killed and I believe a couple children hurt. There were several beneficiaries in that case. Um, in that same wreck, well, then they had another one with Hakeem Pickney, who in that same wreck had a cousin in the car named Natasha Thomas. Okay. Let's talk about the Badger case. Uh, what was the total settlement in that particular case? Um, in the Badger case, the total that was apportioned to Arthur Badger was $3.1 million. There was also a companion case, Donna Badger, with a good bit apportioned to it as well. I can't really call the number right here right off the top of my head. All right. But just for Arthur Badger, who was just one of the clients that Alec had, correct? Right. Just for Arthur Badger, what was the attorney fee that he received in that settlement? He received $1,240,000. The firm did. The firm did. But that would be ultimately on his books at the end of the year. It would be credited to him. $1,260,000, is that right? $1,240,000. Is that all the money that Alec received from that particular case when y'all did your review? That is not. What else did Alec uh, take? 
One million three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Another one point three two five million dollars. Is that right? That's right. And how did he uh, how did he go about doing that? Um, checks were payable to Palmetto State Bank, that were then converted into personal items, payments for bank loans, payments for loans from um, a conservator account, payments to. Johnny Parker, I believe it was, one to his father for paying back personal loans that they had given him. Okay. And so we've got now what's been marked as Exhibit 329 up on the screen. I'll let the sermons go by. Yes, I'll just talk over them. All right, uh, we've got on this one at the top, we have Mr. Arthur Badger, is that right? That's right. And we have the date, uh, and uh, we have the amount, which is how much? 1360000 and that is because we returned the PR fee in that case as well because the PR failed to do their job properly. Okay. And I'm going to show you what's been uh, marked for this hearing is 330, and is this the disbursement sheet? Yes, sir. And down here, we have Palmetto State Bank payment to fund structure per client request. Is that right? That's right. And that's the $1.325 million? That's correct. And did that go to the client? No. I see there's an email right here. Who is that from and to, and what's the date on that? Do you need me to bring it to you? So this email is from Russell to Alec. Doesn't look right. There was an email that came from Alec to Russell asking if we could um, recut the checks in a certain way. Then Russell independently sent an email to Alec, which was forwarded to me and my accounting staff, asking if we could recut the $1.3 million check into four different checks. And did y'all do that? We did. Have any reason at all to mistrust what was going on at that time? No. All right. So ultimately... And ultimately, those got broken down into all these payments. This is the payments of how these checks were written and what benefit they went to. And they were made out to, to what entity? Palmetto State Bank. And then after they uh, were made out to Palmetto State Bank, what happened to them? They got converted to personal usage for Alec Murdoch's benefit. quick I see the spreadsheet says July 2005 I'm gonna point you to this disbursement though what's the date on that disbursement um, November 2012 so is that uh, is that an error that needs to be corrected I'm sure that that's an error that needs to be corrected I'm gonna bring your spreadsheet let's do that real quick I'm getting a pen and uh, Let's talk about another case. I'm looking now at Exhibit 332, and we go back to your spreadsheet, and we have Natasha Thomas. Do you recognize that? I do. All right. And uh, 
What was the amount on that particular one? There were two payments. One was for $325,000 even. The other one was $25,245.08. All right, and looking at Exhibit 332, we have down here at the bottom, we have a payment, and it says what entity right there? Palmetto State Bank. For 325? Yes. So was a check cut from the trust account for 325? Yes. And is that it right there? That is it. And did that money go to the client? No, that money went for Alex's benefit. All right. Did y'all have to pay that back and make that right for his we misappropriation? We did pay that back. What you're seeing now is just all the different payments that were made from that money. Those were converted at the bank into personal use for Alec? That's correct. All right, we're looking at the second check uh, for how much is that? $25,245.08. All right, and that's made out to what entity? Palmetto State Bank. From the client trust account? Correct. Did that go to the client or did that go somewhere else? That went to Alec personal use again. All right. And did you ultimately have to make that right? We did. Okay. Last one is uh, Mr. Hakeem, correct? That's correct. Is that in a companion case to uh, Ms. Thomas? It is. We've got two uh, misappropriations, is that right? That's correct. Looking at this disbursement sheet, uh, we have right here uh, on the disbursement sheet, what entity is that? Palmetto State Bank. For how much? $309,581.46. All right, and that's signed by who on this? Russell Lafitte's conservator. All right. And is that the check right there? That is the check. Made out to what entity? Palmetto State Bank. And what year? December 2011. Okay, and did that money go to the client? It did not. Did you ultimately have to pay that back? We did. And then finally, $60,000 for uh, the PR fee. fee again. We okay. decided to pay the PR fee back. And that's the PR fee right there for Mr. Lafitte. Is that correct? That's right. The one who signed that, that disbursement sheet. That's correct. You mentioned uh, Russell Lafitte. Do you have a relation to Russell Lafitte? Russell Lafitte is my brother-in-law. He's married to my husband's sister. Um, June 7th, 2021, you came in demanding answers about those Ferris fees, correct? That's correct conversation ended because he got a call about his father, correct? That's correct. And the inquiry got pushed to the side because of the tragedy of the murder of Maggie and Paul, is that correct? That's correct. And additionally, Alec called you about having to get finances together for a hearing in the vote case later that week, is that correct? That's correct. And that hearing got canceled as a result of the tragedy of the murder of Maggie and Paul. That's correct. And ultimately, in July, y'all received an email from Chris Wilson saying the money was in the account, is that correct? That's correct. What did you later find out about whether not all that money was in the account? We found out after September 3rd that all that money was not in the account. Chris Wilson called us and 
actually wanted us to pony up the other portion of the money. And what portion was that? There's a couple hundred thousand dollars that was still missing. And once, a few months later, your attention got turned back to these matters and you ran that inquiry, then the whole thing started to unravel, is that correct? That's correct. Griffin? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. You have an idea about how long you plan to be? 30 minutes. Right. Uh, so we'll take about, we'll take a break now for about 10 minutes. Griffin. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Good morning. I want to first just go to June. I may. I'm not. Okay. I want to go to June the seventh when okay. you were up in Alec Murdoch's office, and you and. You were talking to him about the Ferris attorney fee money, correct? Correct. And while you were in the midst of this conversation, he received a telephone call informing uh, him that his father was being readmitted back to the hospital, correct? That was my understanding, yes. And his father had uh, just gotten out of the hospital either that Saturday or or Sunday, right? I don't know. Okay, and do you know that he spent the Friday night in the hospital with his dad? I don't know. Do you, um, well, his father was Randolph Murdoch, who was one of the principals of that law firm, correct? I know who his father was, yes. Was he a principal of the law firm? He was previously. He wasn't at the time of his death. Was he, a, was he beloved by the partners in the law firm? Yes. And his father, um, and, and when Alec got the phone call that his father was going back into the hospital, and you, you mentioned that you know, the belief was that it was terminal. Correct. You, you stopped your work and turned into a friend, right? That's correct. Provided him sympathy, correct? That's correct. And, um, and backed off of what you were doing to allow him to whatever he was going to do with his father. Right? That's right. And so when you walked out of the office, things had come to a standstill uh, as to your investigation through Alec directly as to where's the Ferris fee money, right? That's right. And Mr. Randolph Murdoch passed away Monday was uh, the 7th. He passed away on the 10th, I believe, didn't he? I'm not sure of the date, but that sounds right. Or that Thursday, right. And if Alec had stayed out of the office from the day that, from that Monday when he got a phone call that his dad was going back in the hospital in terminal until his dad passed, and shortly after he passed, I mean, no one would have said a thing in that firm, would they? I'm not sure if they would have not. Okay. Now, what you were looking at, investigating, was where is the fee due to the law firm on the Ferris case, right? That's right. And, and that was a case where Alec was associated with Chris Wilson, and they represented 
plaintiff, I assume, Mr. Ferris or Ms. Ferris or the state of Ferris. Or, Correct. And and they got a um, excellent result as during the case. It was a verdict, a non-jury verdict, of a, after a trial in Richland County. You remember that? I don't know the details of the case, but and and that um, and you were um, the firm got a expense check but no fee check and the immediate question went out to Chris Wilson paralegal where's the fee for the law firm correct that's right and and the paralegal said our bosses got paid and then that caused you to look into the matter that's right okay now and Alec told you no, no, the money is still in uh, Chris Wilson's trust account, right? That's right. And he said that to you on a, multiple occasions. That's right. And in fact, Chris Wilson sent an email saying the money is in my trust account. He did in July. In July, that was forwarded on to you, right? That's right. And um, and I noticed. Um, well, let me back up. Was, did Alec explain, did, did he come up with a story to explain, well, the, the reason the money is in the trust account is because I'm considering whether to structure the fee? We did discuss that, okay. yes. And in, in that law firm, your law firm that you're an employee of, partners have structured attorney's fees in the past, correct? They have. And, and so the, the fact that, and, and just so the record is clear, when we're talking about structuring attorney's fees, it is delaying the payment of the fees um, through some financial product. Isn't that correct? That's right. And by delaying the payment of the fees through a financial product, if successful, you're it allows to delay the payment of taxes on that money. That's correct. Okay. Now, in the times that the fees have been structured in the past, when the payment of the fees have been delayed, um, who is the beneficiary of the financial product? Is it the partner that brought the fee to the firm, or is it the law firm? So we've only done it once or twice in the past, and when it was done, it was the beneficiary was the partner, but it was also contributed and figured into our allocation at the fee breakdown at the end of the year. Okay. So there's no, I mean, the fact that there's a structure at the time you did it, when it was disclosed and above board, it is, and just use, say, a $100,000 fee, for example, I mean, to allocate it to the firm, that partner who delayed receiving $100,000 till sometime in the future would still have to put his 7.5% or her 7.5% into the kitty at the, of the firm? Right, and that would also be a percentage of the money that he would receive that would be taken into account of that. Well, would it? I mean, if, if it was $100,000? It did. So he got credit on, or she got credit for the $100,000 even though... It never went to the firm? Yes. Okay. So if, so if a partner... If a partner had, did it correctly, it would be recognized and it would be accounted for correctly. The question wasn't whether he was going to structure a fee. It was whether he had received the fee personally. I understand. The, um, and, and he had said he had it and it was at Chris Wilson's office. That's what he stated. Now, the uh, spreadsheet and the, and the files that, that you were asked about, I noticed the Ferris matter wasn't on any of them, correct? That's right. And the Ferris matter wasn't on any of them because the Ferris matter, um, the firm ultimately got paid 792000 which was what the firm was owed on the Ferris case. We did. And um, after 
Maggie and Paul's murder, and after Mr. Randolph's death, murder on the 7th, Mr. Randolph Murdoch's death on the 10th, how long of a delay was, was there before you got in touch with Lee Cope and Lee reached out to Chris Wilson? There wasn't a delay in me getting in touch with Lee Cope. Lee Cope knew about it. The decision was made to call me off of it. Now Lee would deal with it from there with Chris Wilson. Okay, so as far as you know, there was no delay. It was just taken over by Lee Cope. There wasn't a delay on my part. It was taken over by Lee Cope. And you don't know whether Lee, um, how long it took Lee to uh, Lee Cope to reach out. You would to have to ask Lee. And so, and you can't testify to that. You would have to ask Lee, right? Yeah, I don't know. And then you had um, talked about a Hershberger case where there was a actually a what appeared on paper to be a structured fee, correct? That's right. And you're having done one in the past, it did not appear that um, that the proper procedures were followed so that Alec would have to pay income tax on it, That's whether correct. it's structured or not. That's correct. And in his explanation, I think you said that was back in Late May, early June. Yeah, that check is May 12, 2021. The mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't be sure when the exact conversations were. They were all going on around the same time, but it had been after that check. Okay. And, that, um, and so the thought there was, and Alec told you that, well, I'm just trying to sort of shelter money from me Put in Maggie's name because I'm making a, a defendant in the voting case. That's correct. Now, the, now you and your firm, and you've had outside forensic accountants um, looking at everything, and, and you don't have any information or evidence or documents that would suggest that any of the Hershberger fee went into Maggie's name. I did not pursue that portion of it. We have. To, um, testimony from Michael Gunn that there was no annuity set up. Right. And I, and I guess, the, you know, right, so as far as you, you can tell Judge Newman here today is that Alec put that money in a fake Forge account that was Alec Murdoch doing business as Forge. Correct. And, and you don't have any information that that money then went into Maggie Murdoch's investment account, personal account, or any sort of account, right? I know that it went into his forge account after that. I don't know how it was used. Okay. And I think you said that um, that you didn't start back up and looking into the Hershberger matter until sometime in, I think you said, did not readdress it until late September. That's correct. Okay. And um, early September, you were sitting in your office and you had a, a epiphany or you know just a thought. Well, let's just see what these. How many times Alex been? His cases have checks going to Forge. Well, when you're speaking of Epiphany, I had started digging through his client list for every fee that he'd brought in. And rather than going one by one, my Epiphany was, let me just run a payment ledger on Forge and see what's, what that turns out, rather than digging one by one. Okay. And what prompted you to do that? Because I was trying to look to see if there had been any more settlements that had been written to Forge like this other one with Hershberger so that we could account for them and discuss how we were going to handle them at the year end with the bonus distribution. I see. And, and at what time of the year do, do you have to prepare final reports um, for the December. partners? December. For December? And when do you start working on that? 
<laughs> it depends every year, but usually December. <laughs> but in, in September, you were, I guess, I mean, doing your job, trying to see if there were other Hershberger type structures out there. That's right. Okay. And um, and so you, you you ran a report of financial records that were maintained at the law firm, correct? Correct. These were electronic records? Yes. And you didn't have to order bank statements for anyone. You had them right there at on your computer system? I have mine, yes. And there's nothing that happened in, well, let me back up. We've, we've seen checks to forge, I think you said, going back to 2015. Correct. Um, have those checks been on the firm um, financial system and maintain them since 2015? They were. They didn't catch our attention before that. Okay. And and there's nothing about the murder of Maggie and Paul that prevented you from accessing that information at any point in time, is there? No, what prevented me was work and personal obligations to get to that point in time to have the opportunity to look. And the, uh, but the information had been at your fingertips. Anything that was done in 2015, it, it was there. 16, it was there. 17, it was there. That's Eight. right. And that's why you were able to go back and, um, and do the work and law firm stood up and made these clients whole. Is that right? That's right. Now, The, do you have the summary exhibit 314 up there? I do not. Can you go through Exhibit 314 and there, um, it, the grand total is $2,841,512.55 and tell us, uh, just identify anyone on this list that is uh, just straight diversion of fees that were due to the law firm. Both Hirschbergers were straight diversions of fees that were due. Is there any other one on here? Partials of some of the other ones. I can't remember the breakdowns, but I know like at least Mallory or some one of those two. Some of them should have been firms fees due to them. Right. But all the other ones, but the Hirschberger matter, involve proceeds that should have gone to the client. Right. Which your client stole, yes. Right. And that, well, you investigated it and you came to that conclusion and the law firm came to that conclusion, right? Yes. Okay. But as part of the investigation, did you have to interview the clients and ask the client, hey, did you authorize Alec to put this in a fake forge account? We did interview the clients, most of them. We met with them. Right. Most of them were very surprised and shocked and stated that they had no idea right. that they had been stolen from. And, and so to establish that the clients didn't authorize Alec to do what he did, I mean, you had to go to the clients. Correct. And get their response. Correct. And you accepted their response, rightfully so, correct? Correct. On, on, 
this on this list of 314 is what is there any is there anyone where you didn't go to the client or the client representative except perhaps Hershberger and say did you authorize Alec to do this I might not have met personally with all of them but somebody within our firm did right Now, Barrett, the, the second one, Barrett Bulware, said took insurance proceeds. That's Exhibit 314. I think you said Alec had power of attorney? They did. And, uh, and was Mr. Bulware alive in 2018? I'm not. I don't remember. And how is it that you know that Alec did not have a permission from Barrett Bulware to keep that money personally that perhaps Mr. Bulware had owed him some money. When um, I believe Ronnie Crosby's the one who spoke with Jarrett Bulware, who is his PR, so that would be a better suited question for Ronnie than it would be for me. So we, we would need Ronnie Crosby and Jarrett Bulware to come in and testify as to what Barrett Bowler may or may not have agreed to do without. You may have one that he could come in and testify that to, but the rest of these on these lists, people have told me that they either did not know about it, it was covered up, or it was forged. And they would need to come in and tell. The they court would, that. and they have. Or they've testified. They believe they have. Not in this proceeding. Not in this proceeding. Now, there's a, there was another group of cases that involved Palmetto State Bank, is that correct? That's right. And your brother-in-law? That's right. And, uh, and again, uh, there's Arthur Badger, Natasha Thomas, Hakeem Pinckney. Uh, do you know if Mr. Lafitte or anyone at the bank was personal representative or conservator for any of these folks? He was conservator for Natasha Thomas. I believe he was conservator for Hakeem Pickney. I can't remember the exact circumstance. And he was the conservator for um, Arthur Badger's wife. Okay. And Mr. Lafitte, I mean, all of these checks went to uh, Palmetto State Bank, correct? Correct. And then from Palmetto State Bank, they were sent out to pay, at, according to your investigation, expenses um, that Alec owed. Is that right? Correct. And repayment, repayment of loans that, that Alec owed, right? Correct. And that Mr. Lafitte uh, was knowledgeable about that, as far as you know, right? It appeared to be. Now, I want to go into... Um, a little bit more detail on some of these. The <coughs> let's just go to. Um, I'm, I'm going to put it up with Miss Elmo. The um, and it is the the. Ben Allen Kendall, well, that's Hershberger, but let's don't do that. Um, let's do the next one, Adriana. And let's see if I can do this right. It's, do, you, do you see that one? That's the um, disbursement sheet? Yes. And, and the recovery amount here is 
Um, and it says settlement proceeds to Forge Consulting, and that's $225,000? Correct. And that, according to this document, represents what the client should have gotten and didn't get? Correct. Okay. And then the attorney's fees here said $22,000. Is that the firm got $22,000? Yes. Okay. And then this same exhibit, there's um, there's a lengthy footnote down here. I guess just does this footnote explain what happened? Yes, it does. In this footnote, it says there were three previous disbursements in this matter. Is that right? Yes. And it says the first one occurred on December 13, 2018, issuing attorney's fees and cost $19,932.89 to Palmetto State Bank, satisfying loans and et cetera, and other matters. Is that right? That's correct. Now, um, do we know if any of those are fake bills? They look to be legitimate. Did you confirm they were legitimate? Yes. And how'd you do that? By looking at the paperwork and observing the paperwork. Okay. And then here, there was another disbursement on December 20th, 2018. Is that right? That's right. And, and this document referenced some, some exhibits. Um, there's an exhibit A through F. I don't believe that's attached. I mean, it may be. I, I don't have it. Um, did you prepare this footnote? I'm not. I don't remember which ones exactly I prepared. I prepared a lot of them, and Chelsea Van prepared a lot of them as well. So. And, and most all of these have an expl explanation and a footnote as to mm -hmm. what the entire transaction was That's about. That's right. Okay. And, and you didn't do every single one. It, it was a team effort, I take it. That's right. And so people on the team investigated it and then would have to uh, come in here, explain exactly what they did and what they learned. And, That's correct. It's and also been through forensic audit and also looked at former FBI and it's been provided to law enforcement who all looked over it as well. Now, uh, I think you also said that on back to June the 7th, that you said that Alex <clears throat> called you and asked for his updated balance in his 401k. That's right. And he told you he was putting together some financial records for uh, civil discovery in the voting case and there was a hearing coming up. Yes. And that he had, um, he had asked you, um, he questioned you uh, previously about the balance in the 401k. That's right. We've, it's not been the first time. And the times that he questioned you, was it, was it in the context of putting together information for the voting case or just he was curious? Putting together information for financials. Okay. Financials in general or fi financials in the voting case or you just don't know? I didn't really ask particulars. So the perception was that it's for the voting case. 
talk in the office when new hearings were coming up, we knew they were looking for his financials. Okay. Well, well, when you said on the 7th he called you about financials, did he reference the Bowdoin case? I that? believe he did. Okay. Now, do you know, do you know, um, what impact or what consequences Alec would have suffered from his partners if he had just, or if you had found that he had diverted the Ferris fee to himself personally, as opposed to putting it in a structure or putting it in the firm. Do you know? I think that he probably would have um, had some bad repercussions for him because they were adamant that we were not going to be part of having any portion of hiding or diverting any fees. And, and the concern was hiding fees from the civil discovery in the voting case? Yes, at that point in time it was. And that wasn't, um, and that, at that point in time, no one was saying that, that they thought he was stealing from the firm, but that we, he was sheltering money from being disclosed. That was the opinion, yes. And then it wasn't until September when you ran a report and you saw all these forged checks being deposited in the Bank of America account and, and endorsed by Alec, you'd seen his signature, that you realize there's been something far different going on than what anyone believed. Is that that's right? correct. And that's what led to his uh, resignation or termination. Correct. So. And that information had been in the books and records of the law firm since 2015. Correct. One last question: that the the information that that in part of the investigation, where you you and members of your staff and the forensic accountants determined that the clients did not authorize any of these transactions. I mean, you have no personal knowledge other than what's been told to you by people working for you or by the clients, right? I also saw, saw some of the deposits going into his personal Bank of America account statements. No, I understand that, but whether the clients. If they had some back deal, I don't know about any of it, no. Right, right. Any information you have about what the clients told the firm is hearsay, as far as you know. It's not hearsay if they said it to me. Okay. And some said it to you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. One thing you know is that the money that you talked about for the fake forge went into an account Richard Alexander Murdoch DBA forge, correct? Correct. Is there any possible legitimate explanation for client trust funds to go into that account? No. And after you realized that they went into those accounts, did the firm ultimately refund the money to those clients? Yes. You mentioned that you actually found in his office some bank statements for that particular account. Is that correct? That's correct. And we'll show you. What's been marked is Exhibit 335. Have you take a look at it? Is that consistent with the Richard Alexander Murdoch DBA fake forge 
account that you saw? Yes. That you had repeated instances of client trust money going into? Yes. That there's no possible legitimate explanation for? That's correct. <clears throat> you were uh, asked some questions about the manner of your inquiry and that sort of thing. And I want to take you back a little bit further very quickly. Do you remember, is it common for, after the books get cleared at the end of the year, for certain partners to loan money to the firm to handle operating uh, expenses until fees start to come in? It is. Um, basically, we wipe out all the cash reserves. So in order to operate for the first couple of months, attorneys will loan money to the firm for operating expenses. At some point in time prior to all of this, did you become aware of an instance in which Alec Murdoch had erroneously see, received a repayment that was actually meant for his brother, Randy? We did. All right. And that, did that happen once or did the same thing happen twice? It actually went through twice. The check was written to him erroneously and within a few days he brought the check back to my staff and had it recut to him. So the first check that was recut was held for him for about a year so the replacement check went through immediately and the first check cleared about a year later and that's when it was discovered that going back and looking that I discovered that he was paid erroneously that it should have been Randolph Murdoch and not R. Alexander Murdoch. So it was one repayment but he managed to get it twice. That's right. How much was that check roughly do you recall? Hundred and twenty-five thousand, roughly. Hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Was he confronted about this when that was discovered? Yes. What was his explanation? His explanation was that it was an accident that he thought it was due to him, and that he didn't know, and that he found the other one later and deposited it too because he thought they were due to him. Okay. And did, was he required to pay that money back? Yes. And after he gave that explanation of "Oops, I didn't realize these two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars checks were for me," was that matter then? forgotten or moved on from? It was shelved, yes. It was shelved. Nothing, no repercussions happened at that point in time or anything like no. that? Okay. So the money gets paid back and then people moved on. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Um, you testified before that when the murders happened that the, the inquiry, nobody was going to bring that up now in the wake of the murders, the Ferris fees that you had talked to Alec about the morning that Maggie and Paul were killed, correct? That's right. It's a family-like place. Um, everybody was concerned for him, his family. We knew we had time to discuss this before the end of the year. And at that point, like we said, we didn't think he was stealing any money from us. They had no reason at that time to think he was stealing, correct? That's right. And so it did get shelved, correct? That's correct. All right, and then in July you got an email, is that correct? That's right. And you testified to this before. What did the email say from Chris Wilson's office? It said that the money was in the account available to us at any time that we would ask. And then so at that point the money seemed like it was there, the money had, is not missing, and so the matter was shelved, is that correct? That's correct. All right. However, you've testified that things have been going on for a while, and it was months later that, that triggered you to do that inquiry, is that correct? That's right. Okay, because there had been multiple instances over the years, is that right? That's right. But that has nothing to do, the fact that that might have occurred regardless of at any point in time because of all the things that have been going on, that has nothing to do with the fact that when things were happening in June, they got shelved, and then you found out the money was there and you thought the mat that matter was closed, is that correct? That's right, we never knew about the prior. We had no reason to look. We had no complaints from clients. We had nobody saying they were missing money. And this just turned up when we started searching because of the Hirschberger and the other relevant things. Has there been instances in which Alec uh, used the firm credit card for personal expenses and was required to pay that back? Yes. And if the money got paid back, well, then the matter, everybody moved on. Is that right? That's right. So there was a history of that. That's right. You get the money back in, and everybody moves on. Is that's that That's right. It's a history of trust and brotherhood. And that's what happened in July in the, with the Ferris fees. Is that correct? That's right. You were asked about whether or not you were told in July that the money was in Chris Wilson's trust account. That's what you were told, is that correct? Correct. Have you come to find out, however, that 
that actually had not been there. We did. And you found this check proving it, correct? That's correct. history of if the money got paid back, people would move on, correct? That's right. Things were continuing to percolate. They got delayed in June because of everything that happened, correct? Correct. But you were now curious, and eventually, months later, you look back at that. Is that correct? That's correct. And that also was highlighted and sparked by the discovery of the check, proving that he had not been telling the truth the entire time. Correct. Thank you. Nothing further. Anything further? Thank you. All right, thank you. You may step down. Well, we're running up on lunchtime. Mr. Uh, Waters, what's next? Well, uh, we can certainly continue with this. We have Annette Griswold, who is uh, Alex's former paralegal, who in large measure will testify to the similar events with Thomas Moore Hirschberger and the Ferris uh, fees. Uh, again, I don't want to be cumulative for purposes of this, but she will uh, certainly add to that. Uh, we also have available uh, on this particular issue uh, Michael Gunn, who is the, uh, the principal in Forge, who of course will testify that he had never had any discussion with Alec about structuring fees, or at least nothing had ever been set up, and that this account is not his, and that all the money in these various transactions never went to him, and that they were diverted. And then we have Chris Wilson as well, who can describe the circumstances of those fares fees. All that would be very lengthy, but we have all of that available in as much as that's uh, necessary to complete this, this story for purposes of uh, the uh, in-camera hearing. Um, we do have, though we have arranged to get additional uh, um, SLED and other witnesses here related outside of this for the afternoon if you wish to make use of the jury for that. Uh, and also as, as it relates uh, to this, and we're also prepared to offer testimony um, about these particular instances, uh, but we do have um, a, a confession of judgment that I would offer. Uh, to the court at this point in time uh, in the Satterfield case. And again, before the jury, we would have testimony about that, but for purposes of clear and convincing evidence, uh, we have this confession of judgment uh, that we would offer uh, for purposes of this hearing as well. Uh, in addition, uh, we have uh, his disbarment um, from the Supreme Court, uh, which also refers to his admissions of financial misconduct, which we believe also are relevant to the court's decision at this point as to whether or not there is clear and convincing evidence established of these various uh, other crimes. And so we would, we would offer those as well uh, to the court for its consideration now. However, we can certainly uh, offer testimony about those aspects as well. I think, Your Honor, if we can uh, get to a decision point on the law firm witnesses, then we can move forward. Uh, and uh, again, we have some witnesses related to Satterfield uh, that we could address and, and try to work that in over the next few days of court time. Uh, and then finally uh, with the boat case as well. And uh, so that would be s some of the financial witnesses that we would offer. And then finally, Your Honor, we do have uh, some witnesses from Palmetto State Bank who will talk about uh, the extent of uh, uh, Alec Murdoch's uh, financial condition at the time the murders happened and, and the reason uh, why, explaining the reason why uh, all these things were occurring and why they were all coming to a head in June of 2021. Mr. Griffin. Your Honor, I, I, I think there's more than enough in the record from this witness to establish that this evidence is not admissible under 404B. And I mean, without even getting to whether they can um, prove it up by clear and convincing evidence, I'm happy to make that argument at any point in time. But if the, the whole landscape that he just talked about um, your, your Honor, 
403 also includes a component of undue delay. And as he just described, all the financial misdeeds or crimes that he wants to prove up, we're going to be here until end of February, I suspect, or March, because that's adding two weeks to this trial. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, and obviously, uh, as I even pointed out with this witness, we're trying to streamline uh, the presentation. Uh, the, frankly, the extent of misappropriation is very, very broad, and we're trying to focus on just a few areas. And the ones that we're focusing on are the ones that really came out of his mouth within seconds of uh, law enforcement being on the scene, within seconds of the 911 uh, call happening, and that is, of course, the boat case. And what does that mean? Uh, that there was, but there's two things that are very temporarily connected with this particular uh, crime, and that is the the uh, confrontation with Miss Seconder that morning over the fares fees that have been percolating for a while, and then number two is that pending hearing that very week in the boat case, which again the po purpose of that hearing is uh, to, um, in a specific uh, request for production and interrogatory, to identify all accounts. And again, once you do that, once those accounts are identified, uh, just like Mitch Seconder was able to do, uh, just like law enforcement was able to do, the state grand jury was able to do, it doesn't take long to figure all that out and, and then lead to not only what's happened here, his disbarment, but also, uh, you know, I don't have to get into this specifically, but 99 counts for which he's facing a possible sentence of life without parole on that alone. And so that kind of consequence that's hanging out there is very much relevant and very timely to what was going on June the 7th in his life. The defense asked the question, can you think of any reason? And all of this going on in his life, which is a stellar series of events like nothing ever seen, is it certainly relevant for the jury to consider when they consider a perfect storm that was arriving for this man on June the 7th. Griffin, the uh, witnesses that are here, um, Ms. Griswold, Chris Wilson, and Mike, uh, Mr. Gunn, uh, the confession of judgment and, and the disbarment, um, do you contest the matters which they uh, are here to testify concerning? It depends on how far they go with their testimony, but I'd certainly, you know, that's predicate for Mr. Gunn to testify. Those They didn't have an account at Bank of America, and those checks were not deposited with us, and I didn't know anything about this. I mean, that we're accept acceptable to that, and just, you know, without knowing the full scope of what they intend to offer, it's hard to say yes, but that's all. I mean, j just like this witness, I mean, she has a lot of information that is uh, – that she learned through invest investigation. But if we had to try this case, you know, 90% of it she couldn't testify to. Your Honor, I point out that those witnesses that I mentioned, as well as every single one of those victims, all testified. Uh, you know, there is transcripts on that, which the defense has had, uh, which, uh, you know, Your Honor has access to as well. Uh, so I don't know that necessarily it needs to all be repeated for your honor's determination now, because again, as he just said, you know, those facts have, have been testified to. Uh, it's just a question of the parameters for this particular trial, which again, the state's intent is not to try a hundred white collar cases in the context of this murder case. It's only to explain to the jury enough of what was going on in an, an unfathomable set of events for a lawyer what was going on in his life that were all coming to a head on June 7th. I can't, I think that's extremely relevant and we plan to do so in a very expedited and focused fashion. Your Honor, I would say for purposes of the trial, going forward with the jury, I mean, we're, we're not stipulating to any facts. Yes, sir. Well, but for purposes of this hearing, I'm, I'm very candid with the court. Yes, sir. As far as the court's view, of things and what the court needs to determine to be convinced that clear and convincing evidence exists. Um, uh, you know, clear and convincing evidence is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt and all that. It says that degree of proof which will give uh, 
me a firm belief as to the facts sought to be proven. Um, and if those specific facts are not being contested, uh, what the communication with Ms. Griswold that's in the record, um, with Chris Wilson, there may be, Attorney Wilson may be some dispute, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Gunn, uh, you know, Forge is a well-known consulting firm and um, and the Bank of America account says Richard A. Murdoch sole proprietor DBA Forge um, uh, confession of judgment um, disbarment uh, you know the I'm, I'm happy to sit and hear any and all of the testimony um, you know, one of the things that did occur in the Siegel case was the um, the judge who got reversed um, didn't want to spend time listening and hearing all of the evidence because of the expediency of things. And, and the court says, although we sympathize with the court's concern about the length and complexity of the trial, um, uh, we nevertheless um, conclude that the importance of the evidence uh, due to the importance of the evidence, it must be presented and the court must receive it. So I am happy to do that um, without uh, needless presentation of evidence twice, more than once. And now uh, I understand the defense's position, and I'm not seeking any waiver on the question of whether or not uh, this should be at, admitted or, or not admitted. I know you each have your arguments on regarding um, 404 issues and I haven't heard much uh, argument on the race gesta issue which is equally important um, or perhaps more important. Um, but if, if you uh, Uh, are interested in contesting the nature of each one of these witnesses' testimony. If they're here and available, we can hear them. I mean, uh, we can. Uh, you indicate that there are some other witnesses on other matters that can occupy the jury for a bit of time this afternoon. Yes, sir. After our discussion this morning, we, we got some folks rolling, and, and after lunch hour, I think we can take us through the end of the day with uh, witnesses that don't relate to this specific issue. We can go in that direction and then uh, resume with this with more witnesses uh, later this afternoon, tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon. I just don't want the jury to sit and to be in an idle format. Um, and to the extent that you all can be in agreement with a path forward, that's best. If you can't, then, you know, then I make the call. Your, Your Honor, I, as I mentioned earlier, I strongly believe that based on what you've heard thus far, it doesn't meet the elements of 404B, and you don't need to get to to, uh, to whether it's been proven up by clear and convincing. I mean, if, if you rule against us on that, then we have to... Well, how about race just I? Well, the only thing that would come close to race just I is... is just I. Race oh, just I. Is, just I. Mean, you just I. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, tomato, tomato, right? And so the only thing that comes close to that is, you know, the in, the encounter on June the seventh by Miss um, by this witness up there about the Ferris matter. So one matter. It's this the it's the Chris Wilson co-counsel fee fee issue, and that that was the only thing he was confronted about in the afternoon before the murders, and. It has to prove the uh, state of mind of the defendant, right. not solely what this witness knew at that moment in time, but what uh, the defendant knew and, and that was subject to exposure. And 
So, Your Honor, in the, um, with regard to the rest just I issue, um, we had briefed State v. King 334 SC 504, and, and, th and that is somewhat similar in that it involved thefts for someone stealing money, and, and there were remote thefts, and there was a theft the night before or close in time to the murders, and the, and the claim was that the murders were done to get money from the victim and that we had thefts earlier in the day or the day previous and then a number of thefts months and years before. Did the judge do a 403 analysis, 403, 404 analysis on King? Well, it, it, the trial judge allowed it in. The Supreme Court, Justice Burnett in 1999, overturned Judge Hicks Harwell uh, for, for admitting the evidence. How? Conducting a 404 analysis, 403 analysis? Well, I mean, they have a footnote in there. You have, hearing. You have, to, you have to do what we're doing now. Yes, sir, but in the case, they said, while the remote thefts may have been mentally minimally relevant show motive under law, the prejudicial effect of this evidence far outweighed the slight probative value. So the Supreme Court did a 403 analysis. And that's in footnote five, Your Honor. Anything else before we break? Uh, we'll resume at We'll resume at two o'clock with uh, at two fifteen with witnesses, and we will resume with um, with witnesses and the pre jury witnesses, and we'll resume with uh, this in camera hearing involving witnesses later. Yes, sir, Your Honor. So be in recess at 2.15. Bring the jury. Thank you. You may call your next witness. The state calls Katie McAllister.
and she take seat in the witness stand. State your name again for the record. Spell your last name. Katie McAllister, M-C-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R. <coughs> Agent McAllister. Hello. Um, could you please tell the jury where you work? <coughs> I work for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, more commonly known as SLED. And how long have you worked for SLED? Ten years. And what is your position there? I'm a senior special agent in the Low Country Region Investigative Services. And were you a senior special agent back in on June 7th of 2021? I was just a regular special agent then. <laughs> Did you have a chance to um, respond to um, Moselle Road um, in that capacity as a SLED agent? I did. Can you tell us when you responded out there? I was told um, late on the night of June 7th to be at the office um, on June 8th. I was given some assignments and then I responded to the actual property around lunchtime on June the 8th, 2021. So June the 8th, the day after the murder <coughs> took place? Yes. And what did you do when you got out there? Myself and uh, Special Agent Croft were almost to the house. There were several people in the roadway. Um, it appeared to be blocked, so we stopped and got out. Did you, um, what were those people up to? There had been a phone located on the side of the road. Okay. And um, whose phone was that? It was Maggie Murdoch's cell phone. And can you tell us about um, your involvement in the collection of Maggie Murdahl's cell phone? Yes, so once we got out of the car, um, I had gloves. Captain Neal retrieved the phone um, from where it was laying. Um, I was standing right beside him when he got a phone call. He handed me the phone with my gloved hands. I held the phone for Investigator Hightower to take a picture of it. Um, the phone call was Captain Neal receiving the passcode. He asked me to confirm it. I typed it in. Um, we confirmed that it was the right passcode. I locked the phone. At that point, Investigator Hightower asked me to put it in airplane mode, which I did. And so what was the point of you putting um, the passcode into that phone? To confirm that the passcode we were given matched the actual phone that we had. To confirm that was Maggie Murdahl's phone? Yes. Okay. And when you unlocked that phone, did you delete any calls? I did not. Did you delete any text messages? I did not. Did you alter any data in that phone? I did not. You locked that phone back immediately? Yeah, as soon as it opened, you know, the screen clears to show that that is the right passcode, I immediately locked it back. Okay. And then what happened to the phone as far as you know? Uh, Captain Neal, who was standing right beside me, took the phone back. All right, let's move on. Uh, what else did you do? So once I arrived on scene, I, myself along with Special Agent Croft were asked to go up to the main house um, to do a search of the property, or of the home. Did you have a search warrant? There was a search warrant, yes. Was that search warrant executed? It was not. Why not? At the time of my arrival, multiple family close friends were at the house. Rather than executing the search warrant and displacing all of those people, we asked for consent and we were given it. And were a lot of people at that residence at the time? There were. You could give us kind of a rough estimate of the amount of people that were there. I would say maybe 20 or 25 people were in the home. And you didn't want to have to ask all those people to leave? Some of them were very upset and we thought it was better to simply ask for consent. Tell us what you found in the search of the house. So upon consent, I walked through the residence. I was looking for weapons and, and ammunition and observe it to anything else that may have been of value. I found nothing, and once I came back downstairs to the gun room, Agent Croft had located several items of interest, some weapons and some ammunition. He and I collected those. I completed a property receipt. Um, let's go back to your search a little bit. When you walked through the house, were you alone? I was not. Who was with you? I believe it was John Marvin Murdoch and Lee Cope. And who were those people? John Marvin Murdoch is Alec Murdoch's brother. Lee Cope is an attorney from their law firm. And what rooms of the house did you search? All of them. And these 
John Marvin and Lee Cope were with you when you went in every room? They were. Did you search any other places? We searched bathrooms, tubs. Um, there were several attic type spaces where different holiday decorations were stored. We looked in there, or I looked in there, and we didn't, we didn't locate anything of value. Did you look anywhere that you thought there could be a long gun? Yes. Did you observe any bloody clothing when you were searching the residence? I did not. And you said you were observant? I was. You mentioned that um, Agent Croft had collected um, some weapons and some ammunition. He did. Um, would that be the um, three shotguns, a Mossberg, a Browning, and a Benelli Super Eagle, along with a 300 blackout rifle? Yes. Okay. And then some various ammunition? Yes. Okay, and what did you do with, with those items? So we gathered them together. I, we, I filled out the property receipt. We took them back to the sled office here in Walterboro where we met with the crime scene agent, Agent Worley, and I receded those items to her. So Agent Worley took custody of those items? She did. Do you recall um, at some point speaking or being present in an interview with um, Buster Murdoch. I was. And was any evidence collected during that interview? Yes, we asked him for um, consent to do a buckle swab and also consent to look at his cell phone. I'm going to show you this case exhibit 217. If you could tell me what that exhibit appears to be. This appears to be the buckle swab from Richard Alexander Buster Murdoch Jr. collected June 10th, 2021 at 3.26 p.m. Now, did you collect this buckle swab? I did not. Who collected it? Lieutenant Charles Gent with SLED. Okay. Were you present when it was collected? I was. How did Lieutenant Gent collect this swab? A buckle swab is just two cotton swabs. He opened them from the packaging, swabbed his mouth, sealed them back up, placed them in the envelope you see there, sealed it, initialed it, and dated it. And he would have sealed that up so um, it was not tampered with, is that correct? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I move States Exhibit 217 into evidence. No objection. I admit it without objection. Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness at this time. Cross-examination. Honor. Yes, sir. Um, let me get. Um, you were present when the phone, Maggie's phone, was recovered, correct? Yes, sir, I was. Matter of fact, that, when we look at one of these pictures, a rubber glove, that's your hand, correct? Yes, sir, it is. And um, are you aware when you got that call with the, um, the passcode that that had been gotten by John Marvin? Was John Marvin down there with you at the, when you found the phone? I don't recall seeing him there, no, sir. Okay. Um, are you aware that that passcode came from Alec Murdoch? No, sir, I was not aware of that. And who gave it to you? Captain Neal. Okay. Now, you searched the house on the morning of, was it the morning of the 8th? It would have been the afternoon. Okay. And you went through the entire house? Yes, sir. How many bedrooms in that house? Do you know? How many, well, how many bathrooms in that house? Three or four. I don't recall the exact okay, number. But you went through every one of them? Yes, sir. And you looked for, at the tub. You looked at the showers, right? Yes, sir. What were you looking for? Ammunition, weapons. Blood? If it was there, I was observant. We were looking for anything at that point. Right. So when you look at the drain in a shower, um, if somebody's recently showered off blood, uh, you would expect to see some trace evidence there, would you not? 
I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that. Do you know whether any, I mean, there are trace evidence forensics people that actually go in and swab those, right? There are, yes, sir. Were they there? No, sir. Did anyone ever ask them to come that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. Do you of, know no, whether sir. any of those showers or tubs uh, were in any way swabbed or checked for blood or tissue or any DNA, anything that would indicate somebody had washed off uh, evidence of a crime? Nothing that I'm aware of. Okay. But you, in visually, apparently you're the only one to do this, correct? Yes, sir. The only person that actually looked at the showers and the tubs, you eyeballed them, right? I did. Um, you're the only person who SLED had examined the showers and tubs. And you're telling this jury you saw no evidence of blood, tissue, or anything that would indicate somebody had showered or washed off or bathed um, to remove evidence of a crime from them. Is that what you're telling us? Yes, sir. There was nothing visible to me. Okay. And you were the only one asked to do that by sweat? As far as I'm aware, yes, sir. Um, did you search the bedrooms? I did. Did you find any clothes anywhere? Shirt, pants, shoes that would indicate... Attention, Your Honor. Could we ask one question at a time, please? Well, I'm just including a class. We're not asking it individually. I apologize. I can do it individually. Take a little longer. Just a little. Thank you. Any clothes, shoes, any evidence of clothing that would have blood on it or indicated had blood on it or tissue, anything that you saw in any of the bedrooms. How many bedrooms? Several. Several. You looked at all of them? Yes, sir, I did. Looked under the beds? I did. In the closets? I did. See any evidence of any clothes that had been uh, involved in any sort of altercation that had left blood or tissue or brains? <laughs> see anything like that in any one of those rooms? No, sir, I didn't find anything like that. Thank you. No further questions. And they redirect. No further state, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. We're going to have you, you leave for the day um, and to return tomorrow at 11.30 will be our start time tomorrow, uh, 11.30. So you get a few extra hours today and tomorrow. Please remember not to discuss the case, to be exposed to any information concerning the case, and we will... See you tomorrow if you go to the jury room. Uh, Mr. Waters, we will continue with the 404 witnesses. Yes, sir, Your Honor. I might have miscalculated by about 30 minutes, so I apologize. The witness is close by. If you'll give me one moment, please.
State's yes, sir. The state calls Michael Gunn for the in-camera hearing. Take a seat in the witness stand. State your whole name. Spell your last name for the record. Uh, yes, ma'am. Michael Gunn. My uh, last name is G-U-N-N. -N. All right, Mr. Gunn, uh, this is obviously an in-camera hearing to determine the admissibility of some of the testimony. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. All right, and so I'm not going to go into all the background and everything for purposes of this hearing, but just very quickly, where do you work? Uh, I'm a principal at Forge Consulting and also do some lobbying work for the South Carolina Association for Justice. Okay, and just very quickly, tell us what Forge Consulting is and what services it provides. Uh, Forge Consulting, we are a general insurance agency, but also offer financial services such as structured settlements, regular annuities, deferral of attorney's fees, trust, we do lien resolution, um, back office trust account risk reconciliation, um, all sorts of things for plaintiffs primarily and, uh, and their families. All right, and then if you could, just very quickly, uh, just for the record, explain what a structure is and how that interfaces with plaintiff's lawyers. Sure. So a traditional structured settlement is between the parties, and that normally means between the plaintiff and the defendant or their insurer. And so usually it was set up in the 80s. Um, it was designed to help plaintiffs protect their money and to keep their money. And it uh, can be earned tax-free, interest grows on that tax-free. Uh, and it's a very good tool, especially for minor children, for those who are incapacitated, disabled, um, because of that growth, it can provide a steady stream of income, hopefully for the rest of their lives. Yes, ma'am. You're, you're talking faster than I do, and that says something. <laughs> I've been accused of that before. <laughs> All right, I, know you, I know you just ran over here, so yeah, let's That's take it down just no worries, no worries. All right, good deal. Okay, so pick it up from there. If you um, so essentially, the structure settlement, though, would come uh, primarily, usually, except in very different, very small circumstances, would come from the uh, defendant and or its insurer to fund the annuity for the client. And so the idea is instead of getting a settlement in a lump sum, it's in an annuity, so they get regular payments over the course of the term of that annuity. Is that is that's great, yes, sir. Right. Um, and uh, so explain to me just very quickly again for the record the concept of constructive receipt and how that affects structures that you may do for uh, a plaintiff's attorney and their clients. Sure. So constructive receipt uh, by the IRS is deemed when the money arrives in the plaintiff's uh, trust account. That would be con considered they have received the funds and therefore the ability to do a structure has been taken off the table. The only way that you could do a structure after that would be to return the funds to the defendant and or its insurer, and then therefore let the, uh, they, would have to, they would have to agree to play ball and redo all the documents because there's so much language that's included in the documents uh, that, that specifies this. All right, so the settlement can't go to the law firm and then to, to the annuity company, that will ruin the constructive receipt and ruin the tax advantages of that. It, it is in very rare cases that, that we're able to do that. But generally. But generally speaking, correct. All right, so generally, your services that you provide are consulting to sort of match up uh, the, the client with an annuity company, and then that money is going to, in the settlement or the, whatever it is, verdict is going to go from the defendant or the insurer that's paying whatever that is, that verdict or settlement, directly to that annuity company for the benefit of that client. That is correct. Can't go to the law firm, generally. Yeah, generally speaking. Okay. All right. Um, how long have you been with uh, Forge Consulting doing this work? It'll be 18 years uh, this summer. All right. And what's the actual full legal name of the entity that you, that you are part of? Forge Consulting, LLC. Okay. Um, over the course of your involvement with this business, have you gotten to know the defendant, Alec Murdoch? I have. Right, and just very quickly, tell me the capacity in which you got to know him. Uh, it bore from a professional relationship, doing work with trial lawyers, conventions, CLEs, things of that nature, which ultimately turned into a you know a friendship from born out of business. Okay. And when you say friendship, was it a close friendship or more like a business relationship type of type of friendship? I would say a, a business relationship type of friendship, but one that you know you would text with and, and call on occasion and things. Okay. Um, did you uh, ever do any structures for any clients uh, that were represented by Alec Murdoch as a plaintiff's lawyer? Uh, yes, we did. All right, and just roughly, you remember how many? Uh, I would probably say around five. Uh, 
is, um, did you ever, what, what's the last one you remember at least having some discussion with him about doing a structure? The last one that I remember having discussion with, I believe, was the Dion Martin case. Okay, and tell me about that. Did that ever come to fruition or not? It did not. All right, and, and tell me what you made. Uh, we sent over some quotes. Uh, we got some information back from, from the defendant. Uh, he sent us uh, information, uh, a signed option, uh, what, which I would assume was Mr. Martin's. Uh, sent some information back, and uh, annuities, you have to understand, are priced on a daily, daily market. Uh, sometimes that, that rate is good for a week or two. Uh, I sent uh, several emails back uh, saying, hey, this rate is going to expire. We need to move forward. We need to move forward. And uh, ultimately, we ended up closing the case cash because it, we never got a response. All right. When you say you sent emails asking for a response, who were you sending those to? I was uh, sending those to uh, Mr. Murdoch as well as uh, his paralegal, Lynette Griswold. And so ultimately got no response, so you just closed the file without any, any services ultimately being provided by Forge Consulting LLC. That is correct, yes, sir. I'm going to show you very quickly what's been marked as Exhibit 321 for the SIM camera hearing. And specifically direct your attention to the fifth page of this exhibit and just see if you recognize that. And then you can flip to the next couple of pages, please. Yes, sir, I do. All right, tell us what that is. Just kind of flip through first. That's just an, annu it's just an annuitized uh, payment stream showing you when the payments will be made. Okay. And what the, what the amount is. And that's kind of the market rate thing you were talking about? Yes, sir. Yes, All right. sir. And what are the next documents? Just uh, next The next documents. page is a disclosure page where we list all our disclosures, and it appears to be have, had been signed by Dion Martin. Okay, keep going. Is that, that's the only forge related documents you see? Um, well, let's see this. Uh, that's the only forge related documents I see. Yes, sir. All right, let me take that back. Yep. Sort of the annuity schedule, is that correct? Yes, sir. And then this is the disclosure page you were talking about? Yep, yes, sir. Right. And that, that is forge generated paperwork typically? That is correct, yes. But this this particular structure was never done because you never got a response from Elkin no, sir. or his office, is that correct? That is correct. <laughs> generally of what people call the boat rack case or the boat case as it relates to the defendant Alec Murdoch? Generally, yes. All right. And just without going to specific facts, generally what was your understanding of that? There was a, a terrible accident that happened somewhere down in the low country involving uh, Mr. Murdoch's son and, and several others. And a young girl passed mm -hmm. away. Were you aware that uh, his son had been charged in that particular case? I was. And were you aware that Alec Murdoch had been sued in a civil matter relating to that case? I believe I was made aware through the news, yes. Um, did you ever have any conversation? Well, let me ask you this first. Is it possible for lawyers to structure fees? Not the client, but the lawyer, if they going to get a big fee from a large recovery and they decide they want the protection of an annuity, can they do that? Yes, they can. All right. And um, how does that work? Kind of the same thing? It's the exact same manner as if the client were to do it. The check would have to come from the insurance carrier and or the defendant to fund the structured settlement annuity for the lawyer for their fee. Did you ever have any discussion with Alec Murdoch, either before or after the boat case, about structuring any fees that he had received in the case? We, we had general uh, conversations about structuring fees, but, uh, but it would be the same conversation I would have with any attorney, like how you would do it, how you would go about doing it, and how, how checks would need be made payable, et cetera. Did you ever have any specific discussion after the boat case about the boat case and him wanting to structure any fees? Not that I recall. Um, I want to take you to uh, September uh, 2021. Um, did you, uh, around that time, receive a call from Lee Cope? I did. All right. And what did Mr. Cope ask you? He called and asked me if he could, in confidence, give me a list of uh, cases and see if we had any files on them. I yes. told him I'd be fine. I was standing in my driveway. I wrote them down, uh, got back with him later that evening, and let him know that we did not have any of those cases open. Okay. He gave you a list of clients and asked if you had any structures open for those or potential structures. He had asked me if we had any files at all. Generally, what we will do is if an attorney calls, we will open the case 
immediately just so we have a name associated with the attorney. Okay. And so he gave you a list of names. Did any of those names have any files? No. Right. Did he ask you about any banking that Forge Consulting LLC did? He did. And what was his question to you? He asked me if we banked with Bank of America. And what was your response? I told him that we had banked with Bank of America but had not for the last three or four years. So you did not have an, act, an active account with Bank of America we did not, in no. September of 2021? No, sir. Did you have any uh, subsequent conversation with uh, Mr. Cope about the issues that he had raised with you? I did. He called me uh, the following day as well, which I believe was a Thursday, with another list of cases. Right. And what was his inquiry to you? Uh, same, same inquiry. Um, this time the only one that popped up was the one I mentioned earlier, which is the Dion Martin case. And your response was there was a file, but it was never completed. There was a file, but it was never completed, and we closed it out. Um, did you uh, ask him at this point or did you, uh, what was going on or why these inquiries were being made? I did not. Did you ultimately find out what was going on and why these inquiries were being made? I found out on Tuesday after Labor Day. All right. What did you find out? I spoke with uh, Lee Cope, and he told me that uh, Alex had been using a, uh, an account called Forge okay. to uh, process the checks. Is that account that he had been using, is that a legitimate Forge consulting account? Absolutely not. Did any of that money that went into that account go to legitimate Forge? No, sir. Did Forge Consulting have anything to do with that particular account? No, sir. Let me uh, show you a couple things real quick. five to your testimony in uh, this in-camera hearing and uh, just have you look at that you look at in, at particular look at the name on that particular account yes sir all right what does that say Richard A Murdoch sole proprietor DBA forge all right and is that account a legitimate forge account it is not a legitimate forge consulting account no sir any money that went into that account did it have any legitimate relationship to the services and business that y'all provide to plaintiffs attorneys? no sir none at all Did that come to any legitimate forge account? It did not. Stand by for me one second. see that if we went through all these exhibits that we introduced with Ms. Seconder with all those checks made out to Forge from the PMPD trust account, uh, they, for purposes of this hearing only, they will stipulate that none of those went to a legitimate Forge account and instead went to the Bank of America DBA, Richard Murdoch DBA Forge account that he just testified is not a legitimate Forge account. I want to be more careful with the words. We are not contesting that issue for purposes of this hearing. <coughs> That's correct. I don't want anything coming back. I accept that stipulation as well. If they're not contesting that these checks didn't, uh, all went to this particular account and did not go to legitimate forge for purposes of this hearing alone, I think that's acceptable to the state, Your Honor. Yes, sir. All right. It's so stipulated. Yeah. Yeah, we're not contesting. That's Yes, sir. Yes. Not contesting. Hmm. <clears throat> just just want to be real quick. 327, is that legit? No, sir. 326, is that legit? No, sir. 
325, is that legit? No, sir. 324, is that legit? No, sir. 323, is that legit? No, sir. 322, is that legit? No, sir. 321, is that legit? No, sir. 320, is that legit? No, sir. 319, is that legit? No, sir. 318, is that legit? No, sir. 317, is that legit? No, sir. 315, is that legit? No, sir. And finally, 311, is that legit? No, sir. And by asking you not legit, did you just look at the checks on those various exhibits? I did. And all the ones that had forged on them from the client trust account, those are not? Checks that went to any legitimate forged account. Is that correct? No, sir. Is that correct? That, that is that is correct. Yes. All right, thank you. Your Honor, I believe that's uh, all the questions I have for this witness. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Thank you. Just really quick. Uh, in any of at any time did uh, you ever hand deliver any checks to Alec Murdoch for forge related business? No, sir. All right. And would that work? I would never I would not be delivering any checks. The the only time that I would ever deliver a check would be made out to someone other than Forge. You would never make a check payable to us. Okay. Um, but you never never had any legitimate business where I was like, Hey, I'm gonna be in town, let me I'll come by and pick up the annuity the check for the annuity or anything. No. Uh, nothing further for uh, purposes of this hearing at this time, Your Honor. I think that's very briefly, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Gunn. Good afternoon. Yeah, um, I am sure that your Ford Consulting LLC has done a full investigation into this matter. Yes, sir, we have. And in that investigation, did you find in any record um, of this? account that Bank of America under Alec Murdoch doing business as Forge. Did you see the name Maggie Murdoch or Paul Murdoch as co-signatories to that account? No, sir. You seen any record, any document that <coughs> Maggie Murdoch or Paul Murdoch had anything to do with this account? No, sir. Your company is a insurance agent. Um, do you, did you ever sell any life insurance to Alec Murdoch on the life of Maggie Murdoch? No, sir. Did you ever sell any life insurance uh, to Alec Murdoch on the life of Paul Murdoch? No, sir. All right. That's all I have, Your Honor. Anything further? Nothing to say, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Let me call your next witness. Your Honor, State calls Chris Wilson. I'm sorry, Your Honor, he's downstairs. Uh, we'll get him right away.
raise your right hand. Let them know the Bible. Do you confirm the testimony by the Bible court in this trial shall be the truth of heaven? I do. State your name again for the record. Spell your last name, please. My name is James Christopher Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N. I go by Chris. Mr. Wilson, you understand that we're here for an in-camera hearing to uh, determine the admissibility of your testimony? I do. All right, and you're a lawyer, so you, you get that. Yes, sir. So I'm not going to go into uh, a lot, everything that I might cover with you in a trial, but I do want to focus on particularly uh, the Ferris case. You know which sure. one I'm referring to? Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, though, uh, just very quickly, uh, you're a lawyer, is that correct? I am, since 1998. 1998. And describe very quickly your practice for the record. Actually, since 1995. I've had my own practice since 1998. Um, in the last 15 years, I've done primarily personal injury work, um, automobile accidents, people that are injured at work, uh, practice type cases, those things. Uh, and where, where do you normally practice? Where's your home base? My only office is in Bamberg. Um, do a lot of clients work? That's all I do anymore. <laughs> For the last 15 years, that's really all I do. And uh, do you know the defendant? I do. And when did you get to know the defendant? I've known Alex since we were in high school, um, Bamberg and Hampton. I grew up in Bamberg, and they're only about 30 miles apart. And so um, I knew of Alec and had been around him some growing up. We had some mutual friends. I was a lot closer to some other guys in Hampton that I grew up playing golf and things like that with. But I would cross paths with Alec. Played on the same baseball team one summer, I think like our seniors in high school or somewhere around high school age. Didn't really keep in touch with him or, or cross paths with him until we ended up going to law school. And we uh, started law school together at Carolina, three years there together at law school and lived together part of the time. Did y'all become friends? We did. Become close friends? Very close. Best friends? Um, he was one of my best friends, yes. And I thought, you know, he was and I thought he felt the same way about me. Feel that way now? I don't know how I feel now, Mr. Waters. Fair enough. <clears throat> um, over the years, as you developed that uh, close friendship with Ellie, did you also have a professional relationship as well? We did. Um, uh, when I finished law school, I went to work in Greenville for a judge for a year. Um, Alec went to um, Buford uh, to work with a law firm there. So we didn't, we'd see each other, um, but it was more socially then. Uh, when I moved back to Bamberg to start practicing where I'd grown up, and he moved back to Hampton a couple years later, we started uh, doing a little bit more work together, and we've done cases together really since 1998. I opened up my own firm in 98. I think that's about the same time he had moved back to his firm, and it was a bigger firm with resources that I didn't have starting out on my own, and so we started working cases together and worked a lot together. Uh, tell me, uh, for the record, uh, how that works when you, you're in a different firm than the firm he was in, correct? Yes. And so when two lawyers from different firms, or three, however many it is, share a case, how do you handle uh, the payment of the fees if, if there's a successful recovery? Well, it really all depends on the agreement that's reached up front between the lawyers and with the client's consent. Um, but generally, um, all the cases that I work with his firm and, and with most firms I do business with, it's a 50-50 it's a split on the fee recovery, or at least an equal split. Maybe if there are more than two lawyers, it'll be an equal split across the board. But generally, it was just my firm and his firm with a 50-50 split. Um, on attorney's fees recovered, and each firm recovers whatever costs they've advanced in the case. And sometimes his firm would advance more of the cost because, you know, they had a, a larger number of lawyers bringing in more money than I was and could afford to handle some of the bigger costs. But it's kind of whoever got the bill paid the bill, and then we reimbursed at the end whoever had advanced the cost. Okay. Client signs off on all of that. Who ultimately, in, in those situations where you're splitting a fee, is that a good, good way to call it? Yes, sir. Who handles the ultimate disbursement? How does that work? Um, 
whichever lawyer receives the settlement checks or the checks to pay whatever verdict or judgment that was received. Um, I, I can't say in every single case with Alex firm, but uh, and having gone back through my files and audited my paperwork, it looks like uh, in almost every single case that we work together, um, I, my, the, the disbursement, the money would come through to me and I would handle the disbursement. They were generally clients where I would associate his firm. They were my clients. They were people that had come to me and um, I wanted them to, uh, you know, frankly know that I was the person that took care of them and, and um, if they need anything, it's like could come back. And so I wanted to be the person handling that part of it also. All right. So if the money comes through you, then just mechanically, how do you go about paying Alec in a case where y'all are splitting a fee or paying the firm? Money comes um, in. Uh, client has to come sign the check or whatever it is, along with my firm if it's made payable. It's generally made payable to Wilson Law Group or Wilson Law Firm and the client. Um, client comes in and signs the check. Uh, I endorse the check. We deposit that into my trust account. Um, if, if it has to sit under uh, Supreme Court rules, sometimes it has to sit for 10 days or more. Um, some smaller checks don't. Um, once it's, um, it's been in the account long enough to be uh, able to be dispersed pursuant to our rules, then, then my bookkeeper does the checks that I instruct her to do, and, and I sign the checks to make disbursements. If they're checks to another law firm, then the money is dispersed um, to that firm. All right. Um, in the course of litigation, are there typically costs and expenses that accrue during the course of that litigation? Almost always. And do those typically get paid out of whatever settlement is reaching, assuming a successful result? They do. Um, all of my fee agreements and every lawyer I've ever worked with have a provision in there that the client understands that the fees are advanced by the lawyer, but upon recovery they're reimbursed or recovered by the, by the lawyer. In a particular case where you're splitting a fee uh, and uh, there were in fact fees and costs associated with a successful recovery, uh, excuse me, costs and expenses associated with a successful recovery, are those issued in a separate check typically or a check together? Uh, when I first started, I think um, my firm was doing cost and fees, not just for other firms, but cost and fees that were payable to my firm in the same check. Um, but I mean, 10 plus years ago, if not longer, we started doing separate checks just to make the accounting and keeping up with it easier. So uh, generally it's a, a fee check and a separate cost check. And in 2020 and 2021, were you issuing those separate checks? Yes. Very quickly, without getting into the details, uh, did you have a, uh, a case in Allendale where you split it with Alec uh, in the early part of 2021? Yes, sir. All right. And ultimately, was there a recovery in that case? There was. And uh, it was actually three cases, but they were similar factually, and so we treated them as one case, but it was three separate, three separate plaintiffs, three separate cases. And ultimately, did you, your office, disperse the fees and the uh, expense check to PMPED? On all three cases, yes, sir. And those checks were made out to what when you uh, disperse those? Um, all three of the fee checks were made payable to, I don't know if we used the acronym PMPED or if we actually spelled out Peters, Murdoch, um, Parker, Dietrich, and Ellsroth, um, but PMPED. Generally, except for the Ferris case, which we'll talk about in a minute, sure. when you had those uh, fee splits uh, with Alec, were the checks made out to PMPED? Yes, they sir. They were signed by you? Yes, sir. And I, I'm the only person who can sign checks in my office. So. Well, and now, I had a partner at one time, but now I'm the only person that can sign checks. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> Did you uh, have a case involving Mack Trucks that involved Ella? Yes, sir. And can you describe to the court uh, how you ended up getting that case and how you ultimately uh, associated Alec in that case? Please? Sure. And I've heard it referred to as the Ferris case of so Mack Trucks and Ferris. I'd rather refer to it as the Mack Trucks case. Um, uh, another lawyer had contacted me about a case that he was working on. Um, felt like he had a, a wreck involving a tractor trailer and an automobile in which a gentleman was injured. Um, I believe he had already filed suit against the tractor trailer company and its driver and, and maybe another party. Um, started looking at the case for and with him. It involved a drive shaft that had fallen out of a, a Mack um, truck into the interstate and this gentleman had, and, and a number of other cars had hit that drive shaft. 
and uh, in looking at it and doing a little bit of research, um, I and he together realized that there very likely could be a products liability case involving a defect with the drive shaft of the truck or something like that. So, um, so I reached out to Alec, um and asked him if he could get involved in the case or would get involved in the case. I mean, that's what his firm specialized in a lot was products liability cases. And we were pushing some deadlines to bring in all the parties that we needed to, and so I reached out pretty quickly because I knew we needed some help. Right. And did he agree to get, be part of that case? He did. Um, as that litigation uh, proceeded, did y'all have, as is typical, some discovery uh, hearings, discovery motions, and that sort of thing? Well, we had a number of them. I don't remember how many. I don't remember how many, but we had a number of different motions and discovery that went back and forth, documents being exchanged, things like that. All right. And did that ultimately set up uh, the prospect of a trial in that case? It did, but it was um, unusual. It wasn't a jury trial like is normally done in, in um, personal injury cases. Um, it was a non-jury trial tried before a circuit court judge with uh, an admission of liability. Um, we waived punitive damages, and there was an agreement between the parties that neither party would appeal the result. And in a uh, case, uh, plaintiff's case, civil plaintiff's case like this, if there's a large recovery, let's say, for the plaintiff, and the defendant decides to appeal, does that typically delay payment of the, the recovery until that appeal is heard and resolved? I mean, it can. Um, it appeals, you never know how long an appeal is going to take, and so if the losing party, the defendant, the company that you're suing, whoever it might be, um, decides to appeal, they can tie the, the verdict up for a while. If you win the appeal, you're going to recover cost and interest, so, um, you know, that's the remedy, but it can tie up money um, for people that are injured that need that money. Did y'all ultimately try that case uh, in a bench trial? We did. Um, what we county had, was it? Excuse me. What county? It was in Richland County, Columbia. And when did y'all try that case? Uh, the first part of January of 2021. And uh, who did the closing argument in that case? Alec. Alec did. Uh, did y'all ultimately, there had been a concession of liability, so the amount was really what was in question. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. And how many plaintiffs did you have? Um, there were actually two cases, I and mean, when we call it Ferris or the Mack Trucks case throughout all of this, but there were actually two cases. Um, the gentleman that was injured and then his wife, um, we brought a loss of consortium claim for her for um, the loss of, of companion services that she had lost from him. And, that, and just not to get too detailed, Mr. Schwartz, that her case had gone into default. In other words, Mack Trucks hadn't answered the papers like they should have. And so they were in a really bad position on that case. And in the gentleman's case, they had answered, but we were discovering some things. Um, when we were doing some discovery, it was clear they didn't want us looking much, much further. And so that's why this deal, everybody agreed to a, a non-jury trial without appeal with a waiver of punitive damages and the mission of liability was done. And we were in COVID and it was gonna take us a while to get to trial. So it worked out well for both parties and the result worked out well for us. And that's often how it goes in litigation. Both sides kind of decide what's best, and sometimes they can have a meeting of the minds. Yes, sir. All right. Was there ultimately uh, a verdict by the judge in that case? Well, two verdicts since two cases, yes, sir. And what were those amounts? Um, I believe it was $4 million for the injured man and one point five for the wife. I remember it was 5.5 combined, but I think it was 4 and 1.5. And so how did the fees break down to the best of your recollection that were going to be split among the three lawyers involved? Um, there were, um, let me ask you this, do you remember how much Alex shared the fees? 792,000. Okay. And yours? There was a, a larger split to the attorney that initiated the case, but I believe Alec was 792. The math didn't work out perfectly. I was 791. And the other attorney was higher than that, but I don't remember the exact numbers. In recognition of his origination. Yes, sir. Uh, in March of 2021, did you ultimately receive the monies and prepare for disbursement? Uh, yes, sir. I believe they came uh, in late February because we dispersed in March. And I, I had to wait at least 10 days. Part of the money came by a wire, which would have been kind of immediately available and accessible, but it was a smaller portion of the money. The larger portion came in a check, 
And because it was such a sizable amount, I waited um, uh, maybe 12 or 15, 15 days or so. I, I didn't disperse on the 10th day. And did you uh, have a conversation with the defendant about dispersing those fees? I had a conversation with, with Alec and with the other attorney I worked on the case with when the fees and were ready to be dispersed. What about your specific conversation with Alec? Did he uh, make any requests of you or have any discussion with you about how to handle his $792,000 share of the fees? He did. Then tell me about that conversation, please. When I contacted him and told him we were getting ready to disperse and we would have checks ready, um, he indicated to me that he was looking to um, place his fees in an annuity. He called it like a structure. I've never done one of those before, so I didn't really know how it worked. I've never done structure for my fees myself. I've structured client money, but not my fees. He indicated he was looking to do a structure by putting the monies into annuities and that the checks needed to be made payable directly to him, um, that he had already cleared it with his firm, that the monies were going to be put on the books and accounted for, and, um, and he would be credited as having received those monies. Based on his representations to you that he had cleared it with his firm, did you agree to do something different and make the checks directly out to him? I did. hearing and see if you recognize that particular document. I do. All right. And what is that? So this is the initial check that was written per Alex instructions directly to him on the gentleman's case for fees made payable to Richard Alexander Murdoch Esquire for $600,000. Right. It's voided. And why was it voided? Um, because he uh, instructed me uh, Afterwards, and I don't remember if it was in the same conversation, in the same conversation, or shortly thereafter. It was, must have been shortly thereafter that the um, checks on that case needed to be made in two separate check payments. So he was doing two separate annuities. Marcus 346 for purposes of the SIM camera hearing and see if you recognize these documents. Yes, sir. The first page is the check payable directly to Richard Alexander Murdoch Esquire um, for $192,000, and that is on the loss of consortium case for the wife. And on the bottom, just like that $600,000 check that was voided, it indicates it was for fees. Um, I guess the other writing on here is maybe from my, uh, um, I'm just so focused, the checks. on the checks. It's something to do with the way we recovered the checks. All right. Uh, the back page looks like an endorsement. Mm -hmm. Um, pay, Bank of America deposit only. Looks like a signature, um, Bank of America. Okay. And again, just I'm just asking you to see if you recognize well, those oh, checks. Yes, I do. Yeah. I recognize them. All right, tell me the second check. What's so, the amount and, and what that's for? The second check is for two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, payable directly to Richard Alexander Murdoch Esquire. Um, it indicates on the bottom that it's for fees. This would be part of the rewrite of that six hundred thousand dollar check that had been voided. All right. And then the third check is three hundred seventy-five thousand dollar check, payable directly to Richard Alexander Murdoch Esquire. 
and it indicates fees, and that would be the remainder the remainder of the rewrite of that six hundred thousand dollar check initially written that was voided. Right. And those second two were rewritten. Why? At um, Alex's request, he had indicated that he was putting the money into two different um, uh, vehicles or annuities, um, and needed the checks written that way. What did you uh, do with those checks after you, uh, the three checks after you had fi finally cut them? Um, obviously I signed them and at some point in time I think Alex sent somebody up to my office to pick them up. I don't think I delivered them. Oftentimes I put checks in the mail, sometimes when they're larger I either offer to have them picked up or delivered and I think he had somebody come pick those up from my office. Like a law firm runner or somebody like that? Something like that, yes sir. I don't even think I was in the office when they picked it up. Uh, You've known Alex for a long time, right? Since the mid, uh, yeah, since the mid '80s, earlier, yeah, mid '80s. Yes, Worked sir. Worked with him for a long time. Many times. Did uh, his explanation to you about what he was going to do? Did that raise any suspicions with you to your friend that you've known for such a long time? No, sir. It was it was different, but it didn't raise any red flags or suspicions to me that anything wrong was going on. Because you trusted your friend, right? Very much. Was your, what was your perception of Alex's general wealth and, and success? I thought he made a lot more money than I did. Um, always seemed to do well in his practice. All I ever heard is that he was one of the biggest producers in the firm. He, you know, it's his family's name on the firm, but they acted like it was, it was his name on the firm too. Um, he and I handled big cases together when I talked to the partners and other members of that firm. They were talking about big cases that they were handling with him. Um, felt like he did really well. And there were, we never got into direct discussions about the amount of money he made or the amount of money I, I made. We talked about, you know, sometimes business and sometimes money and sometimes things, but I never, I always thought he made a lot of money. Is that part of the reason why? Your suspicions weren't, uh, didn't get, uh, didn't arise when you were asked to do this, uh, this request by Alec? I, I guess so. Not, not so much as just I'd, I'd never had any dealings with him that I'd had any reason to distrust what he was telling me. I mean, he was a partner in that firm. He had the authority, as far as I knew, to make decisions. If he'd have wanted to reduce the fee and take less, and it was payable to the firm, I wouldn't have questioned that. I didn't feel like he had to have his authority, his uh, uh, partner's approvals to make those type decisions. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as 347 and see if you recognize that document. Yes, sir. Um, the first check is a check that was made in May of 2021, May 13th, uh, to Peters, Parker, Murdoch, Ellsroth, and Dietrich for $14,619.13. Um, I don't think on the bottom it says anything, but this was a cost reimbursement check on one of those two cases. And then the second check is a check made payable on the same day, May 13th, for the same amount of money plus one cent, so for 14 cents. And uh, it was cost reimbursement in the other case. Right. And that's made payable to the law firm also. Who was your uh, assistant or paralegal at this point in time? Vicki. I mean, she's one of several, but Vicki is my primary paralegal. <clears throat> at some point in May of 2021, did Vicki advise you of any inquiry coming from PMPED about? where these fees were? Um, no, she didn't advise me in May about um, any inquiry about where the fees were. Um, she had received an email in May um, from Ellick's paralegal, Annette, that said, hey, we got the cost checked, but we don't have the fees. Where are the fees? And she um, replied to that email to Annette and said, 
Um, your boss has already been paid the fees just like mine and the other lawyer. I, Vicky replied to that email. I didn't know about that email until all of this came out in September um, uh, of what was going on. Um, I didn't know about that reply email to Annette. Vicky did receive an email, another email from um, Annette, and as I recall, it was an email that Annette had received from Jeannie Seconder that Vicky did forward to me um, sometime towards the end of May. I think she had gotten it, but she was out on vacation for a couple of days, and when she got back, she forwarded it to me. And it was an email from Jeannie Seconder that said something to the effect of, Alec thought he was owed more cost in the case, had some questions about cost, and they were trying to um, get some information so they could determine if they were owed more cost. She did forward me that email. I'll show you what's been marked as 348 <coughs> for the purposes of this hearing, stage 348, and see if you uh, recognize that document. Yes, sir. Um, this looks like the email string where um, Jeannie Seconder, the Chief Financial Officer at PMPED, emailed Annette Griswold, which was Ellick's primary paralegal, um, basically says that Nicole, I don't even know who that is, brought them the expense check and that didn't match their records. Ellick thinks he has more outstanding cost, but can't say what, and they um, want to see if they can get some information concerning expenses and disbursements. Looks like Annette forwarded that to my paralegal Vicky on May the 27th. Um, Vicky was out. Looks like Annette um, asked her again um, on June the 2nd if she could get her some information. And Vicky replied to Annette that she didn't deal with um, some of the documentation they requested, and so she would forward it to me. Okay. And what, that's June the 2nd. When? Uh, two, 2021, June 2nd. June 2nd, 2021. Yes, sir. <coughs> At this point in time, are Alex fees still in your trust account? No, sir. They were dispersed. Um, the check was March. I don't know the exact date, but they were dispersed in three separate checks in March. Okay. At some point in time, around this June 2nd, thereabouts, did you receive any uh, call from Lee Cope? Um, I believe I had a conversation with Lee Cope. I was trying a case in Hampton um, the week before that, um, and I was in and out of their office, and um, I believe I had a conversation with Lee. That would have been like the week of May the 24th or some of those days in there, and I believe I had a conversation with Lee. He asked me um, if all the money had been dispersed in the Ferris case. And I told him that it had not been, that we had some liens outstanding, medical bills and liens outstanding, and we were holding money for some additional costs in case things came in. And um, he didn't ask me any further questions. He did not mention that there were any issues or concerns about fees. After you received that call from Lee Cope, uh, well, what did you tell Lee Cope? I told him I'd have to check into it. Uh, after that, did you uh, reach out to the defendant? I did. And what was your conversation with him? I reached out to Ellick and I said, Ellick, um, you know, hey, um, I, mean, I don't know what all we talked about in that call, but at some point in time we talked about it. I said, hey, I've got this email that's been forwarded to me by Vicki um, where your firm is saying that you believe you're owed more cost. Um, I put the cost down on the, cost, on the disbursement sheet that you had given me. Um, but if you've got more cost, just figure out what it is and get it to me. We're holding some money to deal with some medical bills and liens. And with the client's consent, we were holding some money in case additional costs come in. Sometimes costs are slow coming in, and that's normal. And, um, and if there's an issue, just let me know. Um, he said, you know, I'll check on it, or there's not an issue where I'll check on it. And I said, hey, this is the case that I disperse the fees to you, you know, per your request. 
um, is everything all right? And he said, yeah, I just got to make sure they know it's on the books the right way and that this is the case that, that, that we've already worked out, um, the, the, put it on the books. Did he tell you he had structured those fees and annuities as he had told you before? Yeah, that he had put them in the annuities. Put them in the annuities. The firm's going to make sure they're on the books. As far as I knew, the firm was aware that the monies had been paid to him, that he was putting them into annuities, that they would um, credit him as already having been paid, and they would account for that whenever or however they split up money. And just to be clear, those funds were not in your trust account. They were gone at that point. Yes, sir. They've been gone since March and whenever those checks were cashed after I wrote them in March. $792,000. Yes, sir. For purposes of this hearing, I'm not going to go into the, the night when Maggie and Paul were killed, but just very quickly, you did have some texts and, and calls with Alec that night, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you were at the residence and responding as friends and family did in the aftermath of that event, is that correct? Yes, sir. After the, a few weeks after the murders, did you, uh, I've got one. I got one. You good? Next second. Fine. Fine. Yes, sir. Uh, a few weeks after the murders, did you uh, have another conversation with Alec, asking him if everything had been handled with the firm and those fees? Yes, sir. I don't remember if it was two weeks or three weeks or what it was. I mean, everybody was destroyed. I don't think anybody was focusing on that. I know I wasn't, but at some point in time after that, I just said, hey, is everything all right with the you know, contact? And I got in with those fees, and he said it was. At some point in mid-July 2021, over a month after the murders, did Alec call you up and ask you anything about these fees? He did. And tell me what the conversation with Alec was about these fees. He contacted me um, and said that he was not able to structure the fees the way that he thought he was going to be able to do, that he had messed that up, and that the fees needed to be paid to the firm, and they needed to go back through my trust account. And what did you say at that point? I didn't, I, I didn't see anything that caused me any red flags or anything and felt like if that's what had to be done, that the fees had to be paid to his firm and needed to go back through my trust account, he could send me the money and I could run it back through my trust account and then pay it to his firm. Did, uh, so he's promising, he's saying, I will send you the money back. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you ultimately receive any funds? 600000 of the 792. You only received 600000 Yes, sir. And how did you receive that? Do you recall? I think it came in two different wires, uh, wires, excuse me, that either came on the same day or on back-to-back -back days. Did one of those wires come from Palmetto State Bank for $350,000? I believe so, yes, sir. And that was on, on or about July 15th? That sounds right, yes, sir. And the other was about $250,000 on July 16, 2021? I believe from Bank of America, yes, sir. That was only $600,000? Yes, sir. So you're short from yep. what you'd already given to Alec, correct? Yes, sir. How much are you short? $192,000. $192,000? Yes, sir. Did you have a conversation with Alec about being short? I did. And what was your conversation with Alec? He told me that he wasn't able to access the $192,000 immediately that he had already put it into the annuity, um, but he couldn't do it the way he wanted to, but he couldn't access it because it would be penalized if it was withdrawn, and that, um, that he would get me the money. So what did you do in response to what your friend told you to do, or told you about the reason why he was short $192,000? I mean, at that point, um, I had an indication that I was supposed to have $792,000 in my trust account that was supposed to have been paid to his firm I'm responsible for that trust account. I put $192,000 of my own money in that trust account to cover the shortfall. Based on his representation that he'd get you back? Yes, sir.
going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit uh, 349, States 349, with this uh, in-camera hearing, and do you recognize that? I do. Tell me what that is, please. This is an email that I sent to Ellick at his request. He said he needed to be able to provide it to his firm so they'd know the money was being held, and it was dated July 19th of 2021. It says, Ellick has discussed, I'm confirming that I'm holding in trust $600,000 in the gentleman's case and $192,000 in the lady's case, which represent attorney's fees. I'll continue to hold these monies in trust until I am struck, instructed by you, excuse me, by you or your firm regarding payment. You sent that email at that point in time. Did you receive any further inquiry at that point in time, at least, from the law firm saying, all right, go ahead and send us the 792? Mr. Waters, I didn't hear anything else from um, the law firm at all until September the 3rd, 2021, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when Mr. Lee Cope called me. The first question he asked me was, why, was I still holding $792,000 in my firm? That seemed to be his first concern, and I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, we need to get that money paid to us. And then he told me that um, they had done, they had discovered a check that uh, I think I remember him telling me um, that was from me to Alec in the firm and that they had discovered that Alec was stealing money from the firm and from clients and um, that he could not talk very long um, and asked me not to say anything to anybody until the following Tuesday when they could issue a press release. Let me slow you down just real quick before we get there. Um, at some point in time in August, did you uh, attend any event or any conference where you saw Alec? I did. And what so, was that? Um, it's called South Carolina Association of Justice now. I still call it the Trial Lawyers Association. We have an annual convention in Hilton Head every August, the first weekend, and I usually attend and, and was there. And Alec was there. Did you see there. Alec there? I did. And did you have any conversation with him at that conference about the $192,000 that you covered for him when he was going to pay that back? I believe I asked him about it, and he indicated he was working on it. Um, something, you know, something, some discussion about his father's estate. You know, his father had just passed, and there would be money coming from the estate, and then with um, with Maggie's estate being tied up, um, also. Did he say he might sell some property or something like that? I think he did mention that he was working towards selling some property. <clears throat> At this point in time, still with a couple of months after the tragic murders of Maggie and Paul, were you still very sensitive to your friend's emotional health and well-being? Sure. Uh, I mean, we, I didn't push him. Didn't push him? No, sir. that conference where you asked him about it didn't want to push him did you have another conversation with him about when that money might be paid I believe I did yes sir all right I'm gonna show you what's been marked as states 350 for this hearing see if you recognize that I do tell me what that is it is a very rudimentary handwritten scratched out promissory note that I asked Alec to sign for me which he did August 17th of 2021 um, acknowledging that uh, I had loaned him $192,000 that he would repay within 60 days, I think is what it says. And tell me how the circumstances of how you came to get this, uh, essentially on a folded piece of paper, this is a copy of it, right? It is, yes, sir. All right, tell me about it, please. That was more about, um, I mean, I wanted to get repaid my money as quickly as possible, but that was more about, I was concerned just like everybody else, everybody in his firm and everybody in his family, that he was going to do something to himself, you know, that he was going to kill himself. And, um, I mean, I knew enough to know, to know that if he, that I couldn't make a claim against his estate if there wasn't something in writing. And so that was more, I went to him and said, Alec, look, I hate to even ask this, but I need to ask you to do this in case something happens to you. And I phrased it like if you get hit by a car or something, but it was 
It was more about worried about what he might do. And I need to ask you to do this so that if there's a problem, I can deal with it. And he did. He didn't have a problem with it. You already said this part, but at some point a few weeks later, you get a call from Lee Cope asking about those fees and saying that Alec had been stealing money, right? Yes, sir. Did that hit you like a thunderbolt? It knocked me down. I mean, I, I was with a group of guys. I could not talk. Lee told me he could not talk very long. I'll, I mean, I, I don't know how to react. Did you try to get in touch with Alec? I did. I mean, I, I couldn't do it immediately. I think I spoke to Lee for just a minute. He told me I needed to call him right back. I called him back. We talked for just a minute. He couldn't talk long. He said he had other things to take care of to deal with all of what was going on. Do you remember what day this is? September 3rd, Friday, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 2021? 2021. Yes, sir. Do you remember it like it was yesterday? I'll tell you exactly where I was and who I was with. Tell me more about what happened. Um... I uh, finished up what I was doing with that group. I think I tried to call Alec, or I know I texted him, and I believe I tried to call also, and I couldn't get him. Okay. Did you continue to try to contact him? I did. I think he did respond maybe that afternoon later and said, I'm in a, I forget what it was. It was in a meeting or something. I can't, I'll call you back as soon as I can. But at some point in time, I kept trying to get him, and we did talk later. All right. uh, what did you talk about? What day was that when you finally were able to talk to him? I think I spoke. I did speak to him that evening, this Friday, September the 3rd, by phone. Um, I don't remember the exact of the conversation, but I said, look, Lee's called me and told me what's going on. What is going on? He said, I really can't talk about it much right now. Um, I said, I need to talk to you, and I want it to be in person. I need to know what's going on. And um, What happened next? Well, he... He said he would try to meet with me the next morning and um, um, that he was sorry. And um, I don't remember all the gist of that conversation, but the next morning I tried to call him. I woke up and I started driving towards Beaufort because I thought he was staying at John Marvin's house down that way. And I started calling him and driving his direction. And eventually he called me back and said he would meet me in Almeida at his mom and daddy's house. Did you meet him there? I did. Is that in the morning of September 4th? Probably a little bit before lunchtime, kind of late morning, yes, sir. Did y'all have a conversation? We did. Where was the conversation? Um, I, I got there before he did. Um, I don't think I pulled in the driveway. I kind of waited out on the road. Pulled in the driveway. We went in the side door. The um, caregiver was there. She, we went out onto the front porch, and we talked on the front porch. And what did he say to you? I mean, the first thing I asked him is, you know, Alec, what the, what the F or what the H is going on here? You know, what is going on? And have you done something else to me or that involves me that I don't know about? Because I know about this, and I've got to deal with this, but is there something else you've done that I don't know about that I need to, that I need to be concerned with? And what did he say? He broke down crying. Um, said, I can't, I said, I can't write this second. He went inside, came back out with some paper towels and told me that he had had um, a drug problem, that he was addicted to opioids, and that he had been addicted for, I don't remember if he said 20 or 20 plus years, but it, I mean, it, you know, for 20 years or so. Did he say anything about the money? He told me that he had, that he had been stealing money. Did he have a particular phrase about what he had done to you? Shit me up. He said he shit you up. Shit me up or shit me up or shit me off or something like that, but it was, I think it was he shit me up. And he said that he, he admitted to you he had been stealing client money? Yes, sir. Said he, so he confessed that to you, is that correct? He said you, he had shit a lot of people up. I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 313 in this in-camera hearing. Do you recognize that? Uh, yes, sir. What is that? I think this is the original of that $225,000 fee check written in the gentleman's case directly to Richard Alexander Murdoch Esquire. Is that your signature on it? It is.
conversation then. I don't remember exactly how it ended, Mr. Ward, because I was so mad. I mean, I'd loved the guy for so long. And I probably still loved him a little bit, but I was so mad. And I don't remember how it ended. I left. I mean, I asked him, how, you know, how, how did I not know these things or see these things? You know, and we talked. I don't, I mean, I, he was concerned about me getting my $192,000 back. Seemed concerned. So I wasn't worried about that at that point. I wanted to make sure there wasn't something else. Just a little bit before lunch on September 4th? Yes, sir. I mean, we didn't leave. We didn't. I'm sure we, I'm sure I yelled at the beginning or at least raised my voice, but I didn't leave yelling and screaming and hollering. We didn't fight. But I left and I wasn't happy. Where'd you go after you left? Do you remember? I rode through Hampton. I actually threw Hardy's and grabbed a, something for a bite of lunch on the road and headed back to Columbia where I live. That day, did you hear anything else about Alec? I did. About how long after you left Alec did you hear something? I had stopped at my office in Bamberg or at the post office to pick something up. And um, I was somewhere between Bamberg and Columbia when I got a call. Uh, it was either from Randy or Lee Cope, but I believe it was Lee Cope. And what were you informed? That Ellick had been shot in the head and that he was on a helicopter going to the hospital in Savannah. And I think it was Savannah Hospital, but they said the hospital, but I believe they said Savannah Hospital. What did you do in response to that information? What the devil's going on? I thought he'd tried to kill himself. I didn't think he was suicidal when I left, but when I heard that, I thought he'd tried to kill himself. Did you uh, go to the scene or did you return back home? I went back home. Did you try to reach out to Alec after that? I did not. Um, I talked to his brother Randy, I think some that same day and some on the next day. Um, but by that time, frankly, all this had, for lack of a better term, blown up um, to where I didn't think I'd be able to talk to Alec. And I don't know that I wanted to. Have you had a conversation with him since? I have not spoken to him since that morning at Almeida. Have you had any other communication with him? Um, he's texted me once or twice to which I've responded um, something very generic like I'm thinking about your family. And I think he may have written a letter, some short letter that um, frankly I turned over to my lawyers. I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 351, see if you recognize that. I do. And what is that? This is one of the texts that I received from Alec and my response. Okay. Is that a number you previously had recognized being Alex? Um, I don't know if I'd ever seen that number before, but it's not the normal cell phone number that I would have used to contact him or he to contact me. I mean, there was, sometimes he'd tell me he was calling me from the phone in his car. Sometimes it would be a number I didn't recognize. Yes, sir. Does it say, so sorry for all the havoc I created for you? I'd do anything to make it right? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. That's all the questions for this in-camera hearing, Your Honor. By the defense. We have no questions, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Wilson. Take care. Thank you. How many more witnesses do you anticipate on this? Uh, On this matter, there's 
There's a lot of moving parts, Your Honor. Uh, I do have a, a law firm witness that I would like to call on this particular uh, matter, uh, one of the partners. Um, we have uh, the Satterfield matter. There is a confession of judgment, but we can present testimony on that as well. Uh, and we have a, a bank witness to uh, establish um, a, the financial condition of Alec uh, at the time these murders happened. Uh, which was he was burning through cash like crazy uh, he was uh, out of options the $793,000 was gone in no time at all uh, and I think the evidence is very compelling uh, that for an extended period of time he had been living in a uh, a, a velocity of money uh, that is just really quite stunning and he constantly had it to achieve more money to avoid uh, the, the reckoning that was uh, that was happening. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, and so the, it will show on that particular day that on June 7th, 2021, uh, when he's being uh, you know asked about these Ferris fees, uh, the financial condition uh, is is not good. There's not that money there. He's extremely leveraged in the debt that he has, and it will be part of a history where he is forced to do all these things that we've been showing through Ms. Seconder to stay afloat and to stay one step, step ahead. And for the jury to understand the reality of what he was facing, uh, they have to understand the extent of what is being uh, potentially exposed. They have to understand why he would be doing these things and why he was out of time. Uh, this is not the kind of case uh, where, and I, I don't know if you want legal argument at this point, um, but. Well, I have a question. Yes, sir. I guess this is still your answer. I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Uh, so anyway, this is the kind of case uh, where, for example, he mentions the boat case out of the gate. The boat case, the hearing was going to be that week. Uh, we will establish evidence that the, the hearing was to get access or get identification of his accounts. Once that happens, uh, that he would be unable, uh, there would be not, not long before what had been going on would be exposed. Uh, and what we're talking about, and this is really how it's different from some of the other rest just day and other cases that you're looking at, is it's really about the fear of what is about to be exposed. And what we're talking about again is a, a decade of malfeasance and misappropriation that uh, ultimately would result and the charges that it's resulted in, as well as loss of his livelihood and loss of his uh, law degree. And that's the real fear that was there. And when we look at June 7th in particular, at that point in time, he's out of options. We've heard from Ms. Seconder that in the past, if he'd been able to pay that money or repay that money, then he could always kick that can down the road. But on this particular day, the state uh, believes we have evidence, and we believe it's a reasonable inference from those evidence, that evidence that he was out of options. But for the jury to really understand what's going on, they have to understand the full picture of what this man has been doing and what he's been trying to hide. And frankly, what he was able to successfully hide uh, in the wake of these murders. The bank witnesses will also establish relevant specifically to this particular witness and the events that you've heard about is that uh, one of the first things that Mr. Murdoch did, business related, was to secure $600,000. He got a, an, a loan from PSB, Palmetto State Banks, that wasn't even on the books. They just wired the money. Russell Lafitte wired the money, 350 bucks. He borrowed 250000 from another person, and that's the 600 that he gave to Chris that he used to talk Chris into telling uh, PMPED that all 792 were back in the account. And so again, that's one of the first things he did to stave off the inquiry that very morning, 6721, was to get that money in there, and it did. It staved off the inquiry. The fact that Ms. Seconder, there had been a number of things that had been occurring over a while, uh, ultimately turned her attention back to Alec, it doesn't change the fact that it did effectively uh, delay that time period and delay the, the ultimate uh, detection of that. And he was able to put that money in, much as he was able to do when he stole the $125,000 from his brother, or he used the firm credit card, or what we see throughout this, uh, throughout the extent of his financial uh, matters. So the bank witness ultimately will establish two things. Number one, his financial condition at the time, and number two, uh, his efforts in the wake of the murders to secure that additional money 
uh, so that he could get enough back to Chris Wilson to talk him into telling the law firm that there was nothing to see here, that everything was okay. And frankly, it worked until two things happened. Number one, Ms. Seconder started to look back at the Hirschberg matter, and then more importantly, and we have a, a, another um, law firm witness. I uh, don't know what I, the check's up on the screen. Stand by for me, Your Honor. That found this check right here, this very one, in his office right around that same time in early September. And at that point in time, they knew that he had been lying to him, them about these particular fees. And that's what caused everything to unravel. And then, just like we see, Your Honor, with what happened on June 7th, 2021, within a short period of time, the side of the road happens. And Alec immediately claims that he was the victim of a horrible attack, and everyone immediately assumes that the bad guys are back. There's a symmetry, Your Honor, between what happens on the side of the road and what happens on June 7th, because when the hounds are at the door, when Hannibal's at the gates for Alec Murdoch, violence happens. And the same thing happened on the side of the road that happened on June 7th. And for this jury to understand the real picture of this man that I, I will remind Your Honor, I know you're well aware of, that they have already repeatedly put into issue his character and what a loving father he was and all the rest of it, they need to understand really what this man was hiding. And he was hiding something we have never seen before. And the pressures of that are important for the jury to understand why this man might do that. Mr. Griffin, any comments yeah. you'd like to make? Yes, Your Honor, I would like to re respond. The what, what you've heard thus far today um, does not establish that Hannibal's at the gate in any form or fashion. What, what you heard from Ms. Ses Sessinger, excuse me, is that um, What's the language she is? Hang on, I've got it right here. Quote, there's a history of trust and brotherhood in that firm and that some similar events have happened in the past where Alec had been overdrawn with the firm through you know, loan checks or expense checks and that, and that eventually the money gets paid back and everyone goes about their merry way. I mean, I mean that is basically what she's she testified to your honor and the and this this sort of concept that that Alec committed murders to cause a delay in the firm investigating this diversion of fees was was debunked by her own testimony where she said number one Mr. Randolph Murdoch was going back in the hospital to die and that I stopped in my tracks and I became a friend and stopped looking and that Mr. Murdoch did die. I mean, that's what stopped her conversation and that's what stopped her inquiry on June the 7th by her own testimony. And then you go forward and then um, she says she passed it off to Lee Cope. And then Lee Cope kept following up and, and he communicated with Mr. Wilson. And Mr. Wilson sent an email, Alec had gotten money back into to the account. Um, and frankly, Your Honor, if this plays out, as we attach to our, um, our response, the uh, draft transcript from the trial testimony in Russell Lafitte's case, that Mr. Murdoch had in progress at Palmetto State Bank a loan application to get refinancing, and that Maggie's murder stopped and delayed that. And it had the complete opposite effect. effect. He wasn't he wasn't at the end of his rope. The murder of Maggie, if we have to play out this, you know, this, I mean, the murder of Maggie actually caused a delay in the refinancing of the Edisto house and, and, and it precluded getting additional loans from Moselle. And, and so those are the facts and how murdering Maggie Murdoch and murdering Paul Murdoch eased his financial stress. It, it, it didn't. There's no financial gain, as we said. There's no life insurance. There's nothing to be gained by it. 
And so there's no logical, logical connection from his, uh, you know, disastrous financial house and, and potentially having to be an um, answer to, to financial misconduct within the firm, losing his law license, being criminally prosecuted. First, and, and so to, and, and it's all just a theory. There's no facts. It's all just a theory. But their theory is to, the best way out is for him to murder his wife and son and put himself bullseye in that circle that you heard about in the testimony of this case and that he is the prime suspect number one because he's the father, he's the husband, he finds the bodies, they, he, they show up and he's holding a shotgun and he does that to get out from under scrutiny of a $700,000 diversion of fees with a history of trust and brotherhood in that law firm? Your Honor, that's, there is no logical connection whatsoever, and it does not lead to evidence of motive. And it, you know, we can have more testimony, but, but frankly, Your Honor, it, it doesn't meet. And then if we go into 403 and unfair prejudice, I mean, you heard a lot of unfair prejudice here, but, but, the, but the undue delay, confusion of the issues to the jury, I mean, they've got, you know, a whole lot more evidence about financial misconduct than they have about a murder and evidence of guilt in the murder case. And that's what this is all about. Well, with regard to the um, list of other witnesses that uh, Mr. Waters indicates that, that the state has, um, for purposes of the court being able to do an analysis uh, as to um, whether there's clear and convincing evidence, uh, you've indicated with regard to some of the witnesses, some of the files, you uh, do not or did not con con contest them. But if you have a few employees from the law firm, including uh, Lee Cope, um, Mr. Murr Ducks, Secretary or Administrative Assistant, um, excluding someone from the bank. Who's the other person you mentioned? Well, we have also uh, the Satterfield, which, of course, we have a confession of judgment. For Again, for purposes of this hearing, that, that might be sufficient for your no. court's analysis, although the circumstances, I think, are very relevant. Uh, and then with the boat case, the one thing I want to add, and that would be uh, Mark Tinsley in the boat case, is to understand the context of the boat case and understand how this all relates to everything is not only was the discovery there um, you know being sought by uh, Mr. Tinsley but there will be testimony and again this is all in transcripts which they have and, and uh, you know I don't know we've talked I've talked with the defense about you know obviously they don't have to concede and they'll be able to cross and all the rest of it but you know there is, it is in transcripts they've had a chance to review it uh, whether or not that's sufficient um, at least for an in-camera determination, but one of the things that Mark Tinsley will say was the very aggressive posture which they were taking in the boat case, which meant that Alec Murdoch was not a defendant of convenience, that the goal of the litigation, at least as it related to him, was a personal recovery, and that is why uh, he was proceeding so aggressively uh, in that particular case. Uh, Mark Tinsley will also say that, uh, and we'll talk about how that litigation was going, but we'll also say that after uh, the crimes of uh, June 7th, 2021, uh, that landscape completely changed. Uh, this was an extremely significant liability, and uh, the testimony will be that uh, that aggressive posture, seeking a personal recovery from Alec Murdoch, actually of $10 million, that they weren't coming off that, and that that was the manner in which that litigation was going. Once the murders happened, that was done, uh, and Mr. Tinsley will testify to that, at least the, the posture that they were taking. Well, the court has heard sufficient amount of uh, 
receive sufficient amount of evidence to make a determination um, regarding clear and convincing evidence involving the, the law firm, and I do not need to hear from Mr. Cope or the other witness, what's her name? Ms. Griswold, in order to make that determination of there being clear and convincing evidence. Um, with regard to um, Satterfield, you do have a confession of judgment, which um, the court has not seen or reviewed. With regard to the boat case, there, there's been no testimony. Uh, in the record, regarding the impact of that on Mr. Um, Murdoch's uh, state of mind uh, or the like. So Mr. Tinsley, uh, and particularly considering the um, representations by counsel that, that the uh, plaintiffs in that case were just seeking a financial statement basically. Uh, so the court can hear from Mr. Tinsley, review the confession of judgment, then hear arguments from the parties once again regarding the admissibility of all of this uh, as relates to um, these other bad acts or bad acts, and also the limitation uh, on this, if any. Uh, two matters right now. I do have the confession of judgment, which I can mark, uh, as well as the uh, disbarment. I don't believe the rules require a full-blown trial on these matters for the court to make a determination of um, clear and convincing evidence. I, I do have one, uh, two issues. Uh, it would be, of course, we, we have the bank witnesses to establish that financial condition, uh, and, and there, there's that. The Which bank we witness is all also included. I overlooked yeah. mentioning the bank witness. I do have a pride and that we can definitely do that in the morning. Uh, I do have a problem, unfortunately, that Mr. Tinsley is not available in the morning, but can be here first thing uh, Monday morning, uh, Your Honor. But we can handle the, the bank witnesses in the morning. Right. And again, we do have a transcript. Is the transcript right? is your case. Yeah. Yes, sir. Your Honor, we, we have filed a separate motion with the court on uh, the admissibility of uh, essentially Mr. Tinsley's testimony for any consideration by the court because he's giving, you know, a legal opinion. It's, it's a judicial decision. It's not Mr. Tinsley's decision, and we've submitted that to the court. So we don't think anything Mr. Tinsley has to say would, would be relevant. We'd be prepared to argue that tomorrow or tonight if you'd like. Well, I, I, haven't, I don't, haven't received that motion. You know, here, here's a clocked in copy. Was when, was it, when was it clocked in? January 24th, 2023. January 24th. <laughs> last Tuesday? Long time. When was that? Last Long Tuesday? Time. <laughs> Seems like yesterday. That was last week. <laughs> I did see that I didn't realize that was, per was pertaining to Mr. Tinsley. Um, yes. Well, well, we'll address Mr. Tinsley's issue when Mr. Tinsley is available. Um, I cannot conclude based on argument that his testimony will only be uh, relate to a question of law. Uh, so we'll defer anything, uh, any presentation until Mr. Tinsley is available and then we can press on with the um, other witnesses tomorrow morning before the jury gets here at 11.30. We'll start at 9.30. Uh, hopefully that two-hour window would be, will be sufficient with a break in there somewhere. Uh, regarding the Satterfield matter, um, what's the defense's position on that? Yeah. Your Honor, we agree that they have a confession of judgment. We agree that that there's an order disbarring him for that conduct, and they concluded that that confession of judgment, even though it, it 
it has a disclaimer. Well, anyway, the, the Supreme Court concluded that is an admission. So, uh, for purposes of disbarment, and I'd be hard pressed to argue against that satisfying, clear, and convincing standard. That's all. And what year was that? The, the, the wrongful conduct. Well, yeah, well, the Satterfield matter, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it was quite some time ago. 2019, 20, Satterfield issues separately. Now, on, aside from the court, um, determining just the issues in general regarding whether or not this uh, testimony should be admitted on motive, identity, common scheme, um, race, geste. There's a separate issue regarding remoteness. Uh, and of course, I know the state believes that this is a thread that's woven through all of one thing to the other to the other. That, culminates in, uh, in the um, conduct on June 7th. Uh, we'll, we'll hear arguments on that later. Your Honor, not to belabor the point, I, the, the additional ground would be uh, consciousness of guilt, which is a basis for admissibility. And again, that's that's kind of what we're, uh, we're talking about. I mean, that goes under 404, but the case law is long, the consciousness of guilt. Uh, is fear of detection is, is the basis you for us. submitted something on that? Uh, I'll get you some additional cases on that, Your Honor. We'll have that for you by tomorrow. All right. I'm not sure what act he is going under the consciousness of guilt prong to the extent it exists. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know either, Will. Well, so. Again, it's, uh, he's trying to avoid facing life without parole and the loss of his livelihood. And for the jury to understand that is more than just $792,000. It's, it's this entire time period. And that is really the issue, is avoiding uh, that detection. Okay, well we've um, done enough on this day. We'll resume at 9.30.